so much. And it's so lovely to see so many familiar faces there, and even lovely to see faces that I haven't seen here before. Now, it's, it's six years that we've been doing this talk, it's been seven years since we started, but it's a lot of work for COVID. Now, those of you that have children will know that when you get to six and seven years old, the questions get more awkward. Now, I'm hoping, as a conference we're choosing, we have the great privileges of seeing this conference start from day one and go through and see how the audience, the questioning, the presentations have all grown year on year. And I'm hoping for some really awkward and difficult questions for our speakers today because I'm not giving it to them today. Um, um, we've got a fantastic lineup this year. I know you've seen some of it there, but a lot of the ATAC faculty have come across. The Ultrasound Workshop and the Airway guys have come back again to build on their previous year's success. And I thought a team from my service in London uh, for Thursday afternoon as well. Um, but I think it's shaping up to be a good year, and I think we can want to do is hear from the speakers. So, without wasting much more time, the first speaker we've got today is Simon Carney, Professor Simon Carney. Uh, if you haven't heard his name, you probably should have. He is massive in education. Um, there's an endless podcast, ATAC, uh, to name just a couple of the things that he's involved in. He's an emergency hospital physician from the northwest of England. And what he's going to do today is start to set the scene for the few things we'll be talking about this week. Um, fine, but what I'm trying to do is leave you with questions. Now, you do not need to take any pictures or anything. You all hold that. You don't really need to listen to the detail. It's all very nice and turned into websites. There's a QR code here. I'll put it up again at the end. You can find it very easily. And that's got all the background critical appraisals, all the links to the papers, and everything else that you want to know. Because if you're good, you want to go away and question my opinions because I'm going to give you my opinion. And you won't agree with everything I say, and that's okay. So, looking back at the last year, what we got? I've kind of got some themes that people have found in this tree. The first is around major bleeding. So, let's have a look at some of the papers that have been looking around this year. The first, I'm sure you've seen this one, so you came up with a trial and um, came out last year, all from the internet background. Um, very interesting trial. I have some curious, not curious, but I have some interesting bits right from the beginning of the world in which you noted. Um, it was interesting um, because it was a uh, trial of rebellion, you know, rebellions, um, and it was done in the UK, 16 UK major trial centres were involved. Um, they took patients over the age of 16, they thought they were accelerating from bleeding in the lower limbs or all across the body, and they ran the path into other rebellion, not rebellion, which are all causing my stay mortality. In that you know, first look, there's nothing really wrong with that. I can really be wrong place. But there's nothing really wrong in terms of designs and LCT. It puts people in it. They're the right kind of patients in the emergency department. Interestingly, though, and perhaps not what the original plan of the authors was, it was stopped early because it was increasing mortality in the group of patients who got the rebel. But there's also more time in the ED, and there were also more complications. It didn't really do what we thought it was going to do at all. And there's been lots of debate about this. And um, it's also sort of interesting why that might be, because there are so many aficionados of football around the world, and it does seem to be observational evidence that it can work in some patients, and it almost certainly does. Like a lot of the interventions we're going to be thinking about today, this selection is really important. In this particular study, doing this in the emergency department, at an average of about 90 minutes after the point of injury, then it looks like we're eating how much? For me. It's too late, and those aren't patients who have actively been into death in front of you, and might be the ones who might, 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 because we don't know because we've got the data. And the ones who are the ones who might benefit, so if you're going dead, as a blind pot, probably in the emergency department after one delays, do you have 
Um, in the antipodes, largely looking at whether or not it made a difference to patients who are expected or presumed to have the likelihood of a traumatic coagulopathy. So they took a group of patients who they thought were going to be sick, and they were sick. They used something called coast scoring to determine whether or not they were going to be um, likely to get a major hemorrhage hack required. Um, so not bad. 1,300 patients is a decent trials trial. It's not massive, um, but it's a decent sized trial. They looked at TXA versus placebo and they looked as an outcome at the modified Rankin score, which is a functional score at six months. Now, generally speaking, I kind of like functional scores because that's what patients really value. Um, but there was some debate about whether that was um, the, the right outcome. And actually, you know, I, I think it's reasonable. So let's have a look at what they found. Um, their differentiation between what was good and a bad outcome was between a modified Rankin scale between the green and the yellow here, between an upper severe disability and a lower moderate disability. And if you take that line, you can see the dotted line here, there's no difference. So at six months in terms of modified ranking scale, according to the value that they um, took, there is no difference. There's actually more survivors. So if you look, there's more survivors, but the survivors are in the, severely dis in the um, lower severe disability group. Perhaps not surprising, but if you've got a drug which makes a few more people live, then there may be, oh, those are the ones on the margins and they may have more disability. That's perhaps not a surprise. There's also debate about, and there has been debated about whether or not a six month outcome in functional outcome is the right measure for something which is designed to reduce death from bleeding. But you know, that's open for debate. If you delve into the data a bit more, then certainly outcomes of survival were better at 24 hours and at 28 days. And those kind of numbers and those kind of differences are consistent with what we've seen in a lot of other TXA trials. So it does seem that around about, you know, 1.5 to 2% improved mortality wherever you look in whatever the trials no particular difference in DVTs. So, I don't know, take away from it, you know, TXA is a, a, a highly emotional drug for some reason, I don't really know why. Um, but if you want your patients to live, give them TXA and then hand them over to rehab and see if they can work out what to do. 
But actually, you know, in order for rehab to get better, the patient's got to survive. So it's on the step. Anyway, um, those are the big ones I wanted to talk about. Let's talk about some um, uh, honourable mentions in the bleeding category. I feel like the Oscars now. Um, there's um, a really nice paper from London, which has got a really interesting message looking at the identification of severe hemorrhage. So these are patients who, uh, major trauma patients, and are we as clinicians able to spot whether they're going to require a major hemorrhage pack? or maybe the hemorrhage protocol. And actually we're not bad. Um, we spot it about 70% of the time. And when we spot it, our, so sensitivity of 70%, specificity of 94%. So we say that, you know, they definitely need it, we're probably right, but we miss quite a few. That's okay, I suppose. But the really interesting point in this is the ones that we miss have got triple the mortality. So there's something about you and me about making the decisions, which is really important in the outcomes of these patients. Because the MHP is the MHP. The decision about whether to give it is you and me. And that's in our brains. So this is an area where we think we need to maybe a bit more research and a bit more help and support about decision making. So what about scores? So we've got things like the, which was um, looked at this year, and the, you may be familiar with other scores like the ABC score and shock index and Gestalt to decide whether or not somebody needs a major hemorrhage pack. The RAB score performed as well as all the others, and it's also shite. So. Um, it's not, it's pretty good, but it's not as good as it can, as it needs to be for us to spot that group of patients who we're missing who have triple the mortality. So there's work to be done there. That's really interesting and good work. And I really like this very small qualitative study from, um, again, from the UK Air Ambulance, where they took experienced, really experienced clinicians about what makes them decide to give blood to patients in the pre-hospital area who are, they think are shocked and bleeding out. And that was really interesting. What, what actually do people use as decision-making tools? And what came out of that is they use something called recognition prime decision-making. This is from the work of Gary Klein. If you've ever read Streetlights and Shadows, great book. Scott Weingart talks about it a lot. What they're doing is they're using pattern, so to a degree pattern recognition, but also this ability to model in their head what's going to happen with all the different variables about how sick the patient is, who the patient is, what the injuries are likely to be, where am I, where am I going, all of those things coming together. The bottom line is that complexity, uncertainty and judgment are really important in the management of the bleeding patient. And that's about us as much as it is, is about which drug do we give and does it work in a randomized control trial or does Roboa work, yes or no? That's the big thing I want to take away. A couple of other mentions in there. Top Art was a small RCT looking at artesanate, a malarial drug, had promising stuff in laboratory work, didn't work, but it was a small trial and, and increased a significant increase in DVTs in that for some reason, which we don't really understand at the moment. ProCoag was a RCT of four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate. Again, done a bit like the cryostat thing. So they just gave it to everybody and RCT and it didn't work either way. And again, the outcome from both of those and from in general about these extra bits that we're putting onto coagulopathy is we maybe need to have some numbers and some data to decide who needs it and who doesn't. But of course, if you're with longer memories, remember iTactic, which came out the year before, which is where we did exactly that. We did Rotem and Teg to decide what we would give to patients and judge it on the facts. And that didn't so benefit either, although perhaps it did for the brain injured patients. Subgroup analysis, hypothesis generating. Isn't it interesting? We know loads more and we seem to know less. Fantastic. So let's talk about airway and breathing now. These are some more, a little bit more general type stuff, a little bit more interesting and um, practicality type stuff. There's a nice paper um, looking at um, emergency department operating um, intubation, uh, whether you intubate your major trauma patients who are bleeding and require urgent hemorrhage control, whether you intubate them in the emergency department or the operating room. You think, well, that's not that exciting. But as always, there's a message in here which is a bit more interesting. So what they did is they took 253 USMTCs loads of data, loads of data. And they looked at those patients who required early hemorrhage control. So those are the ones getting to theater within 90 minutes. So these are sick patients, probably a lot of, a lot of penetrating patients. It is retrospective. All the problems are retrospective data, but it's interesting. Um, logistic regression. And they looked for uh, mainly in hospital um, mortality, but also what people were doing and what the, perhaps their decision-making processes were. 9,667 patients of which 20% got intubated in ED. Everything was worse if you intubated them in the ED. They died more often, they had more complications, everything went wrong. And that fits with what I know, because I mean, my life in um, anesthesia when it was, before I went into emergency medicine was, for things like an aneurysm, you don't, over, you don't anesthetize the patient until you can see the whites of the certain eyes, and they're stood next to you and the patient's on the table and ready to go. And that's been my 
mantra, and that's what I've been taught in pre-hospital care as well. You know, you really don't want to put your penetrating, hypertensive, shocked patient who's still just about talking to you. You don't really want to give them an anaesthetic right now unless you absolutely have to because they're going to try and die on you very quickly and they don't need your help. So the thing about this is they go, oh, maybe it's just a case mix. You know, there are those patients who are so sick, you've just got to do it. And I accept that. So what they did is then, then jumped in and said, well, what is, 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 is this about the patient characteristics? And so they looked at the patient characteristics and they could not find this. They found wide variation in practice between units, but they could not see this from the patient data. So the feeling is, my interpretation, and it's, there's an excuse at the end of this for what I'm going to tell you, is there's two universal indications for every procedure in medicine. You can think of any procedure in medicine and they've all got two indications. One, the patient requires it, and two, you really want to do it. And only one of these is actually okay. And it reminds me, always I like to put a side of John Hines in because he's a hero of mine um, and ours. And he always asks, you know, when you're doing practical procedures, are your intentions honourable? And there is something about if you teach emergency physicians, and I am an emergency physician, to intubate people, we really do quite like to do it. But you know what? Sometimes we shouldn't. So let's have a think about that. Again, judgment, uncertainty, and complexity. Um, so that's an interesting one. Go away and have a think. Have a look at your own data when you go back. Let's talk about VL versus DL. Oh, this going on forever. Started at SMAC Conference 1, 2019. I remember talking about uh, 2009. 20, oh, it was a long time ago, 2013. Um, there was a debate about it then. Um, I think this is, we're getting to the point now where we've, we're le learning a little bit more about um, what the data is around VL versus DL, video versus direct laryngoscopy in the critically ill patients. So this is a nice RCT, uh, 17 emergency departments in the US looking at ED intubation, um, and they predominantly looked at first pass success as a marker. Now, interestingly, as an aside, I'm there is a nice paper this year that shows that first pass success in a mature system that works well is not correlated with patient outcome and so arguably first pass success which is you know, pretty much in absolutely every bloody airway trial everywhere may not actually be a good outcome measure so we'll park that for a second and we'll go with this um because what they found is that their first pass success or their, their achievement of getting the tube in um was this um and it, you know two things it was better with video it's not very good so these first part, these success rates are not what I would accept in our service. And that's probably, and it is, because they were in the teaching departments where they were allowing people to learn. And if you looked again in a bit more detail about, does it make a difference between VLDL if you're an experienced intubator? So if you've done more than 100 down here, so that on the right side of the, the line here, it's um, an advantage if you are using VL. Over 100 intubations in the past, it doesn't make any difference really, not statistically. What does this mean? It means for me, two things. One, if I'm teaching, I can teach people how to use it. I can coach them. It's really, really good from that perspective. And pre hospitally if I'm using VL and I've got a, a critical care paramedic with me, they can see what's going on. They can anticipate what I'm doing. I can work together. But actually, getting the tube in is not the major thing. And maybe we should be looking at a different way about outcomes in these trials. Hypertension, hypoxia, cardiac arrest, loss of function. Now, those are probably more relevant to this audience who I hope are competent. Almost there. Right. Uh, I just wanted to wind up some anaesthetists, so I did. Um, they, um, does the size of the blade make a difference on your first pass success? Again, we're back in FPS. It just is. Nice little trial. It's not the greatest science in the world, but it is interesting, actually, because we're talking about marginal gains in how we improve our resuscitation techniques. Um, they looked at 979 intubations um, and they observed they weren't using VL um, about whether they whether they used a, whether it was seen whether you used a Mac 4 and a Mac 3 and whether you got um, better views and first pass success and this is relevant I think because I I was you know I have colleagues I work with who say that you can intubate anybody with a size 4 so just always use a size 4 because you know you can do it a Mac 4 well I can eat my breakfast with a spade but I didn't um, you know it is it is possible and actually, there's, you know, there's a biomechanically, you could argue that it does um, make a difference. You've got a small blade, and, and I had kind of changed my practice before I read this study on uh, listening to other people in the area. The results are interesting, actually. It's observational data. It's not an RCT because you can't do it. But when people chose to use a smaller blade, when they chose to use a smaller blade, they had better outcomes in terms of view, and they had better outcomes in terms of getting the tube in. Interesting. One to think about. Okay. So, yes, you can eat your breakfast with a spade, but don't. Um, right, couple more. 
this is controversial because I think this is a really interesting study in that what we've seen is that a lot of services around the world have been pushing for us not to use large BVMs in our patients at the risk of hyperventilation. And clearly you can look at data physiologically that says if we hyperventilate patients, ROSC patients and cardiac arrest patients, hyperventilate them, their outcomes are worse. And that seems to be true. So we said, oh, okay, well, we can fix that by giving them a smaller bag. I don't think they realize you can just do it faster, but there you go. Um, actually, that's not what happened. Now, it's not really been RCT, but there are areas of the world which have really good data. Seattle, notably, you all know about Seattle's really good data collection around um, cardiac arrest management. And they looked, so they changed in 2015 and they followed it, it changed in 2017. They followed the data from 2015 forward for another few years and had a look at whether or not their patients had ROSC at the end of EMS care. Now it's retrospective, it's observational, so lots of other things could have changed during that period, and they did, but what did they find? So they found quite a significant difference. 67% of the patients were treated with a small bag, and they found worse outcomes. So the mortality, the ROSC rate at the end of EMS care had dropped by 7%. That's really interesting. And I'm not gonna say much more about this, because I know Jason's gonna be talking a lot more about airway stuff in the next lecture, and I think he's gonna tell me why that is, because I don't quite understand it yet. But it's a really good lesson that sometimes observational data post-change is also valuable for us helping to understand what's going on in the world. We need to find an answer for why that is. Notable mentions. Um, let's see, we've got um, three. Um, a nice RCT fairly recently from France looking at comatose patients who said that you don't have to intubate them all if their GCS is, uh, is low, um, particularly if they're pissed. Um, kind of, we knew that. Um, but, you know, just GCS less than eight automatic intubate is, is pretty much, there's lots of evidence now that that's not the case. This is yet another trial in that area. Again, use your judgment, use your thinking, use your words. Um, nice RCT in New England Journal of Medicine about hypercapnia or mild hypercapnia versus normocapnia in the post-cardiac arrest patients. It was thought that mild hypercapnia might be advantageous. We recruited to this one. Um, no change, no difference. So put that one to bed for now. And then an, uh, a good systematic review around the prevalence of severe events. So major adverse events, notably hypoxia, hypoten hypotension and cardiac arrest, the three things I mentioned earlier really quite high in the group of patients we see. In their study, it was as high as 30% across all, I think about 34,000 intubations. Again, that's higher than my service. And that's really, really high. And I'm thinking, you know, who's doing this around the world? Um, hopefully, yeah, good. Um, right, cardiac is going to be really quick because there's only a couple of really interesting trials. Um, one is dose VF. Um, RCT of um, 405 patients looking at refractory VF, which means they've had three shots. And what do we do next? Do we carry on with AP? Do we change it? Uh, do we carry on with antralateral? Do we go to AP or do we go double sequenced defibrillation? So two defibrillators, bang, bang. I've been doing it for years on and off. This is the first trial that defends that practice really well. Survival, big differences. So 30% for DSD to hospital discharge, 13% for usual care. And if you looked at neuro, again, the modified ranking scale with an even higher idea of what the uh, good outcome was, so an outcome of one or two, pretty much going back to normal life, um, it was DSD which made the difference. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with one more trial. Uh, I'm gonna, oh, sorry, I'm gonna briefly mention ECMO to say that, I don't know, there's all sorts of stuff going on out there at the moment. We've had two big negative trials this year, one about um, heart failure, didn't seem to work in heart failure, and there was a Netherlands trial of an RCT of, of ECMO there, which showed no benefit, but quite a few methodological things. I don't know where we are with ECMO at the moment. We're ECMO. I'll wait for you guys to tell me what we should do. And then lastly, I wanted to leave, oh, everything I've spoken about so far is kind of difficult, it's expensive, and it's gonna require system change and leadership, and that's gonna be hard. So I'll leave you something which is free. Ever had a love bite? Don't answer that question. So, um, you know what a hickey is, or a love bite. There's a really just interesting study, I picked it up from Scott Weingart, um, which showed that if you wanna mark the skin, people, I use a Sharpie, but some people get the end of the um, uh, needle cap and put it into the skin, and try and make a hole, and then you go away and you wash it. So you wash off the Sharpie or you mess about and it's just disappeared. Useful for things like chest drains and, and lines and things like that, once you've got the, the drapes on. What they did is they took a 10 mil syringe, you put the 10 mil syringe on the skin, you pull it back 10 mils, you leave it a minute, you take it off. It effectively gives you a little bruise, which of course doesn't go off with um, cleaning, doesn't go off with ultrasound gel, doesn't go off with anything else, and stays there and is absolutely great. And also what they nicely did is they did it across a range of skin types, across the Fitzpatrick scale, and you can see this on all colors of skin. So thank you very much. There is something in this talk which is free, quick, 
and fast and you can take it away and use it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a great thank you. Thank you. What a great way to kick off the conference. Um, do we have any questions oh. from the audience? You put the slide. Can you hear me? It's the first question. I can't see very well with the light in my eyes. Any questions from the audience? Well, I have a question for you. So a couple of those trials are ones that we're going to talk about later in the week. So I don't know if you'd been sort of, you know, breaking into my files to see, see what other speakers are going to be speaking about. But of all those ones there, which is the one that will have changed your practice the most this year? Uh, DOCF. So I think that's the one that we can practically do all the time. Um, and as a pre-hospital physician and as an emergency physician, the patients I see in VF are usually already in refractory VF because somebody else has been at the scene first or they've brought the patient to hospital. They've already shocked them three times. So my attitude and my sort of approach to, um, if I hear we're going to a patient with a VF or a patient with VF is coming in, I'm thinking actually, where are we down that algorithm? Now, and it's not in all the, all the um, guidelines as yet, but I think that's, that's the one that's made the biggest difference in practice. And anecdotally, I've had some success and, and I'd be interested to hear over the next few days whether other people have done as well. Does anyone here do DCD? Down there? And that, well, what are your experiences with it? Um, I've encountered some resistance, yeah. Yeah, because I, I know initially when it came out, there was a lot on sort of social media and sort of chat sites about people poo-pooing it or going for it completely and, and sort of quite polarizing as a topic. Yeah, so there is resistance to it because it's not necessarily in all the, in the guidelines as yet. But again, when, when we're getting involved, I'm going to say we, the, the, the group of people here, we're generally accessing the patients in cardiac arrest to the point where the usual stuff has failed. So people have done the stuff that they should be doing. Our, our local ambulance service is really good at running arrests according to the ALS guidelines. I've, I don't have any problem with that. We're getting to the patient when that hasn't worked. And so if we're going along and we're just doing the same, oddly enough, it doesn't usually work. We have to be thinking about what we're doing differently and taking the care onto a higher level. So that is things like putting art lines in and looking what their diastolics are, getting those to the right problem, maybe getting the adrenaline by infusion rather than by um, intermittent boluses, looking at DSD. And again, you know, we can talk about human factors, but when we do arrests with the ambulance service, they usually carry on doing the arrest. They're doing the operational cycle, 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 cycle stuff. What we're doing is strategy and intervention, which is focused and targeted to what we think the underlying problem is. That's what we can contribute, and, and that's what I think we can do. Don't take over the arrest. The, the people who are running the arrest, our paramedics, they do it really well. And we can do similar things in hospital. There's so much going on in a, in a complicated arrest, you don't have enough bandwidth to run it and also to work out what's going on and where we're going next. So make it easy. And th this is a theme that's been around for a while, but yeah, putting it into practice can be a bit tricky. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, next, we have a speaker who's returning to us, um, uh, Dr. Sarah Crager. Now, I, I was looking through her uh, her bio, and it's like it's like a tick box of all the major American institutions. So Yale, UCLA, Stanford, back to UCLA. I mean, where's Harvard? I mean, honestly, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a person all the way. A few things yeah. out, but um, she's a she's a world famous international educator, um, specifically in ICU and critical care. And, um, and she's won multiple teaching awards. And it's, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Sarah Craig to come back to us again today. Hey, everybody. I am an emergency physician and intensivist at UCLA. We're going to talk about the shock continuum, where I am going to try and convince you to think about shock a little bit differently. We have a blood pressure problem. Obsession, even, I might call it. And this problem, I don't quite know where it comes from, but it's the one vital sign more than any other that we like to focus on. I mean, before COVID, we kind of like the O2 sat better, but these days we're kind of blasé about it, like 80, I can live with that, 70, a little bit worried. Now it's all about the blood pressure. I mean, think about it. When somebody comes to you with any other abnormal vital sign, heart rate, O2 sat, anything, what's the very next question you ask? The blood pressure. 
Why do we love blood pressure so much? I think it has a lot to do with this. This is one of my favorite quotes. Measure what is important. Don't make important what you can measure. And we are especially susceptible to this in medicine. Why? We are care providers. We're physicians. We're nurses. We like things we can measure. We're tested on things we can measure. Things we can measure, we can say definitive statements about. Like, if the map is 66, they are not in shock. If it is 64, now they are in shock. We like definitive statements like that. The problem is our blood pressure obsession, our addiction to definitive numbers causes us to miss things and not just anything. It causes us to miss things that matter. Because not all misses are created equal in medicine. I mean, if I fail to notice that my patient has a renal tubular acidosis, it just doesn't matter. Or a couple nights ago, I was resuscitating in the CTICU. And there was this patient, and they start bleeding, and they're like 500 in the chest tube every 15 minutes. And we end up having, you know, tamponade, and the CT surgeon has to open the chest at bedside. And then in the morning, patient's doing much better. And on morning rounds, somebody's like, yes, but did you notice for the last couple hours, the sugar's been almost 300? I was like, really? Come on, guys. That's just not a miss that matters. But some misses do. And most of the misses that really do matter, the ones that make the difference between your patient, either yes, dying or not dying, but more importantly, or at least as importantly, walking out of the hospital and going back to their life, or maybe leaving the hospital after a three-month ICU stay, getting paked and tragged, paked and tragged, whatever we're calling it these days, and going to a long-term care facility, are often the ones where speed matters. They're the ones that when matters, not just the what. I mean, if I take a patient with hemorrhagic shock and I correctly diagnose that they're massively hemorrhaging, but I do it 12 hours too late, I haven't really done anything useful. And this is where we get this idea of the golden hour. But we often talk about it in the context of trauma. Everybody knows this concept in the context of trauma. But I like to interpret it a little bit because it's not just an hour. I mean, an hour is a nice amount of time, but some amount of time. And not just in trauma, but in shock in general. Because what we're really saying here is that we have a window. We have a window before our patient falls off that physiologic cliff. And ideally, what we would really like is to be the fence at the top of the cliff, not the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. But in order to accomplish that, we have to reframe something. We really have to internalize the following. Shock is not about hypotension. Shock is about hypoperfusion. Now, we know that if you asked a test question, but we haven't really internalized it because we still believe on some very deep level that there's some direct chain together link between tissue perfusion and blood pressure. That if the blood pressure is good, we are perfusing the tissues. If the blood pressure is bad, we are not perfusing the tissues. And it turns out that is simply not true. There have been plenty of studies looking at this difference, and it turns out that tissue perfusion, independent of blood pressure, is, unsurprisingly, independently related to outcomes. It is not just about blood pressure. You can have a great blood pressure and not be perfusing your tissues. Your blood pressure can be not so great, and you're actually perfusing fine. And what matters at the end of the day? It's not blood pressure. It is tissue perfusion. That is where the magic happens. So if we all know that, I mean, at least to take a test, if you're on your critical care boards and they ask you, would you rather have tissue perfusion or blood pressure, we can answer this question theoretically. So if that's the case, we all kind of know this deep down, hypothetically at least, what is it with blood pressure? And as we said, the lovely thing about blood pressure is that we can measure it. The problem with blood pressure is that if you equate shock with hypotension, that is a great way to miss our golden hour. So what I would like us all to start doing is to start thinking better. We need to start thinking in a much more sophisticated way about shock. So in order to get you all thinking about shock in a much more sophisticated way, I would like to present you with a cartoon. Let's take this cartoon. That is you and that is your patient. Your patient, unfortunately, is swimming in a raging river. And your patient wants to keep swimming because at the end of that river, we have a cliff. We have a waterfall, and they don't want to go down the waterfall. So I want you all to take a minute. Picture you are swimming against raging rapids. Or if you don't like swimming, you are maybe running or biking. But you're swimming along, and you're starting to get tired. You start to get to kipnik. Your heart rate goes up. You're getting diaphoretic. And at some point, you just get so tired, you just can't keep going anymore, and you know that cliff is coming, 
but you're exhausted and you just can't keep going more. And this is what happens. This right here is the difference between compensated and decompensated shock. And eventually, when you are in decompensated shock, you start getting end organ dysfunction, actually resulting in death, which is not where we want to be. And so really, the way to think about compensated versus decompensated shock is this. It is not a state, it is a balance. It is a balance between physiologic stress and physiologic reserve. And that balance is different in every patient. And this is why doing things like, you know that chart we all had to memorize in med school to pass the test that was like, if you've lost this much blood and your heart rate is this and your blood pressure is this, it means I don't know something. I clearly have gotten that chart because I never thought it was useful. Because what it means if I have a otherwise really healthy 18 year old guy who's actually lost three liters of blood, well, he has very robust physiologic reserve under an extreme physiologic stress. On the other hand, if I have a little 98 year old lady who has heart failure and renal failure, who's on a beta blocker and everything failure, who has a little UTI, somehow physiologic reserve, not so much, but physiologic stress also not so much, what shock looks like in those two patients is very difficult. And if you try and memorize a chart, it's not going to apply. So we have our balance. We have compensated shock, where my patient's physiologic reserve exceeds their physiologic stress. Then we have decompensated shock, where now that balance shifts. Now their physiologic stress is exceeding their physiologic reserve. What do I call this? I talk about the shock continuum. What does this continuum look like? Well, we have some inciting event, whatever it is that put our patient in that raging river in the first place. Now we have this initial state of shock, and that is a state of physiologic stress. Think about how you're feeling early on. You're swimming full out, you're running full out, you're biking all out. That state of physiologic stress, that state of hypertension, tachycardia, diaphoresis, physiologic stress. Now, ultimately, when your body can't handle that physiologic stress, we now transition into a state of tissue hypoperfusion, ultimately resulting in end organ dysfunction and death. And this is what I like to call the shock continuum. We can't ask, is our patient in shock, yes or no? We ask ourselves, where are they on our shock continuum? Because at the end of the day, what we need to focus on to catch our patients early is right here, this sympathetically activated state. And this is why if you fail to understand this continuum, you will also miss your golden hour because equating shock with hypotension that's late shock. Because what else happens in a physiologically stressed state? Hypertension, right? What is your blood pressure doing when you're tachycardic, tachypnic diaphoresis? If you measured your blood pressure during that period, you would be hypertensive. And we see this practically all the time in the trauma bay. A trauma patient, lung healthy patient comes in and they come in and you know that they lost a lot of blood in the field, but they come in and they're tachycardic to the 150s and they look like they don't look so good. But that first blood pressure, they're hypertensive. They're like 150 over 90 and everybody gets all reassured because they're hyper, not hypotensive. That is the patient's physiologic epidrip because they all have an endogenous epidrip. It's going bananas, right? tension from that sympathetic activation from that physiologic stress is masking their hypotension. Here's the thing. Like everything in medicine, just because we don't notice it doesn't mean it's not there. Your pace is in shock, whether you fail to notice it or not. And in medicine, we like to give our own misfaults name. There's a name for this. There's a name for us not noticing shock. It's called occult shock. We talk about it like it's a medical term rather than a miss on our part, when in reality, all shock is, is the physician conflating hypotension and hypoperfusion. So if I just told you that blood pressure is not a super fantastic way to know if your patient is in shock, the next question you are all very reasonably asking is, okay, if that's the case, how do I know when my patient is in shock? And I am sorry to have to report that there is no single metric lab measurement score that will definitively tell you yes or no to shock. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, your mic's my mic cutting out. Just kidding. Fixie. I put it over here. This is a special and awkward moment in the lineup. And I'm just going to use instead this. Yes, maybe. Testing, testing. This is a secret test to see how good my presentation skills are. Can I just take this off? As I said, this is a secret test of presentation skills, not so secret test. How about this? Can you hear me? No. <laughs> Testing. 
success. Success? Yes, success. Okay, fantastic. So what actually just happened is nobody wanted to hear that actually there's no definitive test to identify shock. <laughs> you were just like, earmuffs, that doesn't sound good, that's gonna make my life difficult, let's not hear that. Um, and I'm sorry to tell you this, because it would be nice if there was some test where we could be like, okay, if the test number is greater than 37.26, they're in shock. If it's less than that, they're not in shock. Unfortunately, that's not an option. Our only option here is to do thinking. Now, fortunately, we can do this thinking without the need of any fancy technology. We don't need a swan. We don't need a sublingual something something monitor. All we need is a couple of basic things that are right in front of us no matter where you are. They're right in front of us, whether we are in the ED, whether we're in the ICU, or often most importantly, if we're in the field. Now, when we are thinking about these things, the things on our exam, labs, and monitor that'll tell us when we put them all together whether our patient's in shock, we need to think about those metrics, those data points in the context of our physiologic stress, in the context of our shock continuum. Because any one of those numbers can indicate one or more of these things on our shock continuum. Some metrics tell you about the inciting event. Some metrics indicate to you that your patient has physiologic stress. Others indicate tissue hypoperfusion, and eventually some of them indicate in organ dysfunction. So as we talk about these, think about which one might be indicating what. So let's start with labs. Mental status. So this one we need to be very cautious about especially with the agitated patient. And this has gotten me into trouble over and over again, especially if the patient has a psych history. But here's the thing. If you are running really hard on a treadmill and you're like, I'm really tired, I can't keep running, and somebody else is like, no, just keep running. Yeah, you're gonna get kind of agitated because patients who feel like they're about to die, it tends to be quite agitating. So don't mistake this for the patient is just, you know, having a psych issue or just like yelling and screaming for the fun of it. They're agitated. Now that's the physiologic stress response. And if they transition into the tissue hypoperfusion response and they are now hypoperfusing their brain and they do like that, that's bad. That's now tissue hypoperfusion. That is the other end of the spectrum. Mental status, agitation, and also the bleh, the bleh response. There's a technical name for it, I don't know what it is. All right, next, work of breathing. And what I mean here is not respiratory rate, but think about how you breathe when you're swimming or running. You don't go, you don't take rapid shallow breaths. You're at first trying to take big deep breaths. You use your accessory muscles. And accessory muscle use more than anything else makes me concerned. Now watch how this guy is breathing. He's not super tachypnic, but look at his accessory muscles. Now ultimately, this again, physiologic stress right here. When the patient does start taking rapid shallow breathing, now I'm concerned because now they cannot keep up anymore. Now I'm worried they're going into that phase where they're starting to hypoperfuse. But this is another thing we have to be very careful about for something I call the dyspnea masquerade. So this one right here, this is when we get confused and we believe that because the patient's not breathing well, it means they have a respiratory problem because, you know, the lung bone's connected to the can't breathe bone and that must mean the respiratory thing's the problem, but not necessarily. And this is important to recognize that just because they can't breathe, the patient tells you even they can't breathe, doesn't mean we should intubate them. Because if in fact they can't breathe because they're in shock, intubating them can do more harm than good. Intubating them is a great way for a clean assassination. So think about this. When you see a patient in respiratory distress, if you think it's because they're in shock, maybe now's the time to investigate, not intubate. I should, that almost rhymes, right? I should make that into a thing. If ABCs can be a thing, investigate, not intubate. Anyway, I'm going to coin that right now. Um, all right. Skin exam. This is incredibly useful. And this is another thing where you have a spectrum. When the patient is diaphoretic, this is our physiologic stress response. And once they progress into modeling, yep, now they're hypoperfusing everything, including their skin. All right, capillary refill time. This is the first time that we encounter our helpful, friendly fingers. Because our fingers are very, very helpful in shock. I kind of think about them as the canary in the coal mine for shock. They are the first things that get hit because when you think about shock, what is your body trying to do? Well, it doesn't really care about the fingers. It's like, let's preserve flow to the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the fingers, nah, we don't really care about them. So early on, we are going to see problems with the fingers. There are early warning signs and capillary refill is one of them. We have some data that capillary refill may be just as good as lactate when we're looking at shock. 
I personally think that that data may be telling us that lactate's not so useful in that capillary refill. Who knows? However, capillary refill useful thing. Labs. Oh, wait, before we get to labs, very important thing, urine output. Okay, urine output is a very, very useful metric, but it's also a dangerous metric. Why? Because the kidneys are dumb. The kidneys cannot understand why a patient's in shock. Because when the kidneys evolved, what happened was, okay, when they evolved back in the day, if they were not getting enough perfusion, it was either because you were being chased by a tiger and ended up getting bitten and were bleeding to death, or because maybe you had cholera and were having massive diarrhea. So the kidneys believe on a very fundamental evolutionary level that if they're not getting perfused, it's because they're hypovolemic. They didn't stick around for when cardiogenic shock happened. That was much later. People didn't die of cardiogenic shock back then. So urine output, a very important thing, except if you believe that no urine output means you should give fluids. That is not what it means. It does probably mean the kidneys aren't getting enough perfusion. It just doesn't tell you why labs. Now, some of your labs tell you about physiologic stress versus hypoperfusion. Lactate. This is an important one. Lactate is a very useful number. It's just not a crystal ball that tells you about shock. And here's the problem with lactate. Lactate cannot be used to either rule in nor rule out shock. Why can't you use lactate to rule in shock? Well, that is because it's a physiologic stress thing. Lactate is not just about hypoperfusion. It is actually about physiologic stress as well. And think about it. Somebody has massive seizure. Somebody comes in on a bunch of meth, or maybe you just give too much albuterol. Your lactate can go up just from that beta receptor stimulation, just from that stress. And that is why it can't be used to rule in shock. I have some more bad news about lactate. It also can't be used to rule out shock. This looked at a bunch of patients. They had septic shock. Well, they had sepsis, we like to call it. But they were sick enough that they were having organ dysfunction. They were in the ICU. And unfortunately, they found the following. Nearly 50% of those patients, sick enough to be admitted to the ICU with sepsis, had a normal lactate within the first 24 hours when we are seeing this patient. You cannot use lactate to rule out shock as well. Not to mention that the other mistake we make with lactate is that we forget that a high lactate tells you absolutely nothing about why the patient may be in shock. Lactate does not equate with sepsis or any other kind of shock. It just tells you there's either physiologic stress or tissue hypoperfusion. What else? Base excess bicarb. Metabolic acidosis I find very concerning. And you can have a metabolic acidosis without a high lactate. And that is a thing that's on the top of my list that deeply concerns me when I see it in a patient who I think might be in shock. All right, white count. Here is the thing about white count. Stress leukocytosis is a thing. A high white count may tell you about the inciting event. It may tell you why the patient is in shock, that they have an infection. Or it may just tell you there's a stress response. We see this in trauma patients all the time. They come in, they just had a big trauma. Their white count is 15. Did they get sepsis on the way to their car accident? Possibly, but I doubt it. Stress leukocytosis is a thing. Another thing is glucose, because stress hyperglycemia, also a thing. We see this all the time in the post-CT surgery patients. We put them all on insulin out of the OR. Why? They didn't develop diabetes intra-op, but physiologic stress states can cause hyperglycemia. And sometimes this causes misses because we see hyperglycemia, a gap acidosis, and we're like, aha, they must have DKA. Unless they have stress hyperglycemia from profound shock and that gap acidosis is actually a lactic acidosis. But this is again when our handy dandy fingers are useful because in addition to cap refill, there's another thing. When your patient crosses from that physiologic stress state to the tissue hypoperfusion state, now you can see something different. Now the body's lying, eh, we don't need the fingers, we'll just not give them that much blood flow. And what you can see is, in a patient with profound shock, you can actually see their finger stick glucose, not their serum glucose, but their finger stick glucose can actually be low. All right, organ dysfunction. We now have a bunch of labs that just tell us that, yeah, okay, the organs are suffering, we're hypoperfusing them. Those are all the usual things. Creatinine, LFTs, INR, you can even get a trope leak from just physiologic stress. Your heart is working overtime. Now, what about the monitor? The monitor actually in certain ways is the least useful of these things. First, heart rate. This is an easy one. Keep in mind, your patient is undergoing a stress test in real time. Now, 
heart rate is useful, the higher it goes, probably bad. And sometimes you'll see this thing where the heart rate's up, it goes up some more, it goes up some more right before they decide to crash on you. But if you have a little old lady on a beta blocker or any other pharmacology interfering with their heart rate, you might not see that. And that patient might crash early because they can't mount that physiologic stress response. They have pharmacologically prevented from doing so. SpO2 waveform. This is one that gets us in trouble all the time, but this is where our fingers again are our friends. Because what is the body doing? Not perfusing the fingers. What does that mean? You're not going to have a great SpO2 waveform. Now, this can be a particular problem in the patient who's really tachypnic. Because the resident will come to you and be like, okay, the patient's tachypnic, they're working really hard to breathe, and their SpO2 is low. And you go into the room, and indeed, they're tachypnic. They're using their accessory muscles. You look at the monitor, and their SpO2 is like, I don't know, 88, falling to 87. And then the next thing everybody does is they, they get out a bunch of other O2SAT probes, and we're like, oh, let's try the other finger. Let's try the ear. Let's try the toe. Let's see what happens. When what you should really be doing is putting on a blood pressure cuff and checking the blood pressure, because this is your fingers telling you you are not perfusing them. Last but not least, blood pressure. Right? I mean, it is on there. It is an important thing, but I'm including it last because it's a thing, but it's not the thing. It is a data point. It is an important data point, but it is not the only data point. So you can see from this list that there is no one single definitive test for shock. Instead, we need to be smart. We need to do thinking. We need to take all of our metrics, understand what they mean and they don't mean, understand that it's not about blood pressure. It's about looking at our metrics, thinking about our shock continuum, putting together our data points to tell us not yes or no, does the patient have shock, but where might they be on our shock continuum? Now, once we've answered the question, yeah, we think the patient's on the shock continuum, the next obvious question is why? Why is my patient in shock? And again, here is an important time not to conflate these two questions, because I often see the following. My resident correctly identifies, for whatever reason, that my patient is in shock. Pat on the bat, fantastic, and the next thing they say is best give them 30 cc's per kilo and antibiotics. And I'm like, no. Apparently there's a face I make that's very specific when my residents want to do that. Um, I've stopped sort of putting my head in my hands and actually crying because they would get upset when I do that. But shock does not mean sepsis they are two different things identifying that your patient is in shock in no way have you identified why they're in shock and this right here is the state of check you noted they're in shock but why we call this undifferentiated shock when you are trying to figure out why your patient is in shock stay tuned if you want to talk more about that tomorrow morning at 9 30 we will be back right here to talk about how do you figure out what kind of shock your patient's in Thank you guys for listening. A version of this lecture and lots of other stuff there. The end. Thank you so much, Sarah. I, I think it's always the mark of a, a fantastic educator when you make a really complex topic so simple and understandable. Um, any questions from the audience? Any, any questions from the audience? Great, that means I get to ask my question. <laughs> so a few years ago, we had some uh, speakers here talking about microvascular monitoring and mitochondrial resuscitation. And I was wondering, I mean, because in terms of medical devices, the US tends to get the best first. What's your experience of these or what's your opinion on these? Um, so I think this is one of these things that in a couple years, this is going to be a very useful data point. I think one pitfall that we like to get into when we have a new test is we like to try and make it the only data point. We like to try and do studies on that test and be like, can this one thing identify shock with an AUC? That's amazing. And that's clearly not the answer. That's never the answer. Um, so I think one of the things is just to realize it's going to be a data point, but not the data point like everything else. And two, 
we need to know what to do with that data. Because right now, it's one of those things that we get a lot of data from it, but what does it mean? So I think ultimately, it's actually gonna turn into a very, very useful data point. But one, it's a technology most of us don't have. Two, even once we do have it, we're gonna get used to using it, and that's gonna take time, especially when we have to integrate it into all of the other data points we use for shock. Thank you so much. Um, anything from the audience? And I guess, thank you very, very much. Look forward to seeing you at the bar and, uh, and at the workshop. Thank you. So next, we move back across the Atlantic to Cardiff uh, in Wales, in, in the UK. Um, and our next speaker is Matthew Morgan. And he is an intensivist uh, in Cardiff and has recently returned from Perth in Western Australia. Um, and as well as being an established and leading anaesthetist in his department, he's also an author, which gives him a unique perspective. Now, I understand you did a, a PhD in artificial intelligence, and I haven't used ChatGPT to write these, I promise. Um, but I think the, the two books you've written so far, Critical, which is very well known, and, and uh, One Medicine, which is a bit more recent, um, sort of start exploring the patient experience. And I think one of the things that we do very well, uh, certainly everyone that's trained in the UK knows that whatever you do, even if the patient is profoundly unconscious or decapitated, is you must introduce yourself to the patient first because that gets you one point on the mark scheme in every exam. Um, and we are quite good at doing verbal communication or at least being aware that it's a thing. But I think one thing we're not so good at is the other forms of communication. I believe this is what Matt is going to talk to us about. So welcome. Thank you. Words have power, written words have power, and your written words have huge amounts of power. But I think in the clamour of oral communication skills, workshops, human factors, we've perhaps forgotten about the lowly written word. And today I'm hoping to show you that words have power. I'm hoping to show you that your words can have power and, most importantly, they can affect patients that we care for. And there's no better illustration of this than the Mexican artist's installation here, where a book, those words physically change brick. They physically move objects. And the fascinating thing about this is that that book at the base was written by Kaffer. It was a book called The Castle. He was a really introverted guy, actually published very much until he died and so even for those introverted who don't want to stand here on stage who don't want to change the world through talks through phone through social media your words can equally have as much power and I was new to this five years ago I hadn't written a thing I couldn't spell my own name in school and growing up as a kid I loved science I loved gadgets I loved all the things that little boys growing up loved. What I didn't love uh, was words. I hardly read a book. Um, but that changed, and like all good stories, it changed thanks to a trip to Dublin <laughs> and a pint or two of Guinness. Um, and it changed because I went to talk about my PhD, which is on immunology. In fact, it was about a, a white cell that's 0.001% of all of your lymphocytes. Fascinating topic. I'm not talking about it today. You'll be pleased to know. Um, and I gave this talk and I thought oh, I felt very proud of myself. But I spoke to people in the audience who knew more about the topic than me. I felt like a fraud. And that night, after a few pints of Guinness, I met somebody local from Dublin who said, what do you do? I said, I'm a doctor. What kind of doctor? I work in the intensive care unit. And they said something profound. They said, what's that? And I realized I'd spent decades of my life on this one immune cell, talking to audiences that knew the topic better than me, publishing papers that nobody reads, apart from my mum. And I'd forgotten about the most important thing. I'd forgotten about those patients. I'd forgotten about people don't even know the topic where I work, the place I work. They don't even know what intensive care is. 
And actually, this shouldn't have come as a surprise to me because years before, as a medical student, I remembered a great question somebody had asked us as we were training. They said, what do all patients, what do all families want? Lots of people put up their hands and said, a diagnosis, a treatment, a cure, analgesia. But actually, a lot of the patients I care for and you care for perhaps already have a diagnosis. Perhaps there isn't a cure. They already are unconscious, but they all still want something. And they all want somebody to make sense of their story, even if that story is their last story, even if it results in their death. And so after those pints of Guinness, well, not immediately after, quite long after, actually, when my headache had gone, I decided I wanted to tell the story of intensive care medicine. Uh, and that's when I wrote this book, Critical, that was mentioned. Um, and to start the book, I really wanted to start with the important people, the patients and the first patient. Who was the world's first intensive care patient? Well, I think it was this person. I think it was Vivi, who was a 12 year old girl in Copenhagen, who in 1952 developed acute severe polio. And the amazing thing about this, the reason I show it today, these are Vivi's actual notes. They're from the Medical Museum in Copenhagen. And that's a picture of Vivi. And I think that's something we've lost. And the notes beautifully describe two things. Physiology. They talk about sats and being blue and cyanosis. But they talk about her story. They give a narrative of her story. And there's a picture of Vivi at the top. And that's something we still can't replicate in our electronic medical records. So I followed Vivi's story. Um, I found some of the medical students who cared for her, who squeezed a bag after a tube was inserted into her trachea by Bjorn Ibsen and others in Copenhagen. And those medical students who squeezed that bag for hours and weeks and months. I tracked down Vivi's family. This is Sven, uh, Vivi's cousin, who's still alive actually, who remembered Vivi come into his house on a portable ventilator when she survived. Uh, and she did survive. She lived until the age of mid-twenties. She fell in love. She had a summer house. She had a dog. And she still loved reading. And she still loved reading about cycling, actually, uh, which was her passion. So for me, that was my reintroduction uh, to the world of words and the power those words can have. And the book is filled with science, yes. Uh, but it's also filled with stories. And actually, it's the stories that people remember, not my 0.01% lymphocyte, which is in there, by the way. Chapter 6 is great. Um, <laughs> it's filled with stories. It's filled with the story of Chris. Probably the reason I chose intensive care as a specialty. Who developed severe sepsis after a gap year in Kenya. Who died six weeks later in Cardiff, a day after his 18th birthday. It's filled with the story of Stephen, who developed a sudden intercerebral bleed and was the world's first patient who had brainstem death testing uh, videoed and actually transmitted on the BBC programme The Greatest Gift. Uh, because he gave The Greatest Gift, he went on to donate and impacted the lives of many others. And the book also contains the story of Roy, who sadly was never going to leave intensive care, was never going to survive um, but did fall in love and he wanted to marry his long-term partner Leslie which he did here in the intensive care unit surrounded by the people who had cared for him and it was actually those stories those words rather than the science which have most affected patients readers and the letters I get never talk about my lymphocyte they talk about Chris they talk about Stephen and they talk about Roy it wasn't all smooth sailing. Uh, when I told my mum the book's finally on Amazon, she quickly typed it into her web browser and I had a pretty worried phone call from her uh, five months later, actually. Um, because the top hit, uh, uh, it's a very good book, actually. There's no lymphocytes. Uh, the, the, the audio book is much better. Um, there's there's no lymphocytes in there. Um, 
and disturbingly it's higher than my rankings uh, <laughs> and I think it's a lot better actually so uh, there were worrying times but as a result I'm I'm I'm, I'm hugely honoured to have written a second book, which I'm talking about tomorrow, about animal medicine, and had the opportunity to write in a number of other publications in the US and the UK. And then through COVID, uh, a small letter that I wrote literally after a night shift sitting on my sofa, that was actually a letter to my mum and my brother-in-law, who's a wheelchair, saying that, don't worry, if you're in those vulnerable groups, we're also thinking about you. We haven't gone because the narrative in COVID was, don't worry, it's just the frail and the elderly. Everyone else will be okay. And that as a narrative wasn't good enough for me. Uh, and that letter, uh, something I wrote on the sofa in five minutes that anybody could have done, hopefully helped more people through COVID than steroid prescribed uh, during the months that followed. Uh, and hopefully in the months that are coming, I'm helping with a screenplay called Nye, which is talking about uh, the NHS uh, and will be in the National in London from, from March. But I say all this not not because of me, not because I'm special, I'm gen genuinely not. I couldn't spell my own name in school. I hadn't written anything five years ago. Uh, I say this because that could be anybody in this room. In fact, many of you already do these things. And for those that don't, please remember the power of words and not only oral communication. You can perhaps care for and impact more people through your words than you can through your physical hands through a career. And you are already amazing authors. You may not feel it, but you are. Just to get where you are today, to sit here, you've probably sat over 100 exams, most of them written. You've written over 200 essays. You may be right as many as 20 letters a day, a week, whether they are outpatient letters. Think about the amount of inpatient notes you write. And the things you see are the very things that people want to hear about that can help people. They are small windows into big worlds, which is what people want. Uh, and they are the things which make me and you cry or chuckle uh, or clench. They are the patients that arrive suddenly, unexpectedly. They are the sad stories with a happy ending. They are the happy stories with a sad ending. And what we forget is an average day in the office for you and I is an amazing day at an office for most other people in the world. Uh, and the things that are obvious to you are amazing to others and they want to hear about them. And not only do they want to hear about them, your words can radically impact on others, as I say, perhaps more uh, than your own hands. It's also an amazing way of debriefing. When I have a hard day at work, rather than shout at the dog or the children, well, I do shout at the dog and the children, but I also write things down. And they tend to be the columns in the BMJ and others that are most read, the things that mostly pissed me off that day or I thought could have been better. And they are not complex things. They are things that everybody here know and they are things that everybody here can perhaps solve much better than I. There's also a lot of sadness in our world. Um, this is probably one of my favourite photographs ever. This was a photo taken by Sir Arthur Eddington in 1910 in the West African island of Principe and it was taken during a rare solar eclipse and it was this photo which proved Einstein's theory how gravity changes time and light true but they could only do this photo they could only see the tiny planets around the rim of that eclipse which bent the light which they predicted they could only do this during an they could only do it when it was dark and sometimes darkness can show us the light. The sad times in work are sometimes the most powerful things to make us learn about us and to make us learn about our patients. So words have power. And I want to leave you today with a few practical things, how you can put this into place when you return home to work. I want to remind you that the pen is mightier 
than the scalpel and you can tell the surgeons that um, and hopefully these will be three things to take away and put into place they don't cost anything they're not complex you're perhaps doing them anyway and the first thing is to bring back narrative and i think thinking back to vivi's notes that little girl in 1952 yes there was data in there but actually what was written was narrative it was story and i think especially with today's electronic health records the bullet point is king uh, but next time you use a bullet point i want you to imagine me shooting you with that bullet point and instead i want you to write some narrative because the things we see are so complex that you'll end up with 50 bullet points we don't have people with single diseases anymore we have people that look like this and turning this into a set of 100 bullet points is perhaps pointless and that's even more the case when we look at the sheer amount of data we're dealing with every day this is a snapshot from a patient that I was caring for using an electronic health record. I was sitting at home trying to do a handover, um, looking through all the data, looking through all the notes, looking through all the blood tests, all the scans, the MRIs, the echoes, the ECGs. It made no sense to me. And then I had a handover from my colleague on the phone with no data. All I had were words. And just from a small number of words, you can synthesize all of that data through narrative. You know, anybody here in this room, through reading this short paragraph, can probably go in and care for this patient tomorrow. You will also know the three most important words in medicine that we don't say enough, which is, I don't know. Because narrative also allows us uncertainty. And that's something that bullet points and question marks don't allow. So one thing to take home, when you see a cacophony of data, when you see complexity, think about using narrative rather than just bullet points. But doing that is hard. It takes time and it can be a bit verbose. So a hack or a way around that, and I make no apologies for this phrase, is using stock phrases. Now, I don't mean stock phrases for patients. Every patient is different. You need to take the context. But there are regular things we do on a daily basis which are complicated and the words we use have to be phrased very carefully. You wouldn't have a solicitor inventing a new statute or inventing a new law every time they pass uh, documents to clients or contract to clients. They are very well constructed words. And when our words can mean the difference between life or death, admission or no admission to the ICU. I don't think we should be reinventing those complex narratives and those complex balancing phrases every time. Stock phrases can help with that. And I've got a range of stock phrases, which I have, sometimes on a USB, sometimes on an electronic health record that I use as a basis, and the basis being the important bit, for communication and written communication put in context for that with that patient. I'm just going to show you some examples of these and these need to be yours. They need to be subjective to you, but this is an example. Uh, and the underlying bits really show some of these important words. We are worried about you. You are sick enough to die. This is an amazing phrase from Catherine Mannix, who's a palliative care physician in the UK. She's written some great books. And for me, this phrase encaptures all of ICU. We are worried about you, says we've noticed, we've seen that you have shock and that we are concerned. You are sick enough to die means you're critically ill. We've recognized that, but there's uncertainty in here. It doesn't say you are going to die. It says you're sick enough to die. So there's always hope. And I think that's super important to patients uh, and to families. There's a lot of text here, but the top one talks about frailty and survivorship. The second one is a really difficult balance of burdens and benefits and how do we get to a best interest decision and again these words need to bring in human frailty law and ethics so why invent them or reinvent them every time 
And finally, the last phrase doesn't say, we won't admit you to ICU. It's not a negative. It's saying what we will do. We'll instead focus our treatment on sym symptomatic control. We'll move to palliative care. So try to use positive words rather than negative words. And then finally, I don't know about you, but beds in our hospital are pretty rare. And a lot of my time is spent balancing risks and benefits about who can be safely admitted and who needs to sadly wait to be safely admitted. So words can also be powerful in protecting yourselves in tricky times. So you can't admit someone. There's no bed. The organisation is aware of this. That's super important. We can't currently admit somebody. Doesn't mean we won't. And we can't admit you directly to the critical care unit. You still receive critical care, but perhaps in a ward-based setting. So these are some examples of stock phrases that you can develop yourselves to make narrative easier, quicker, and make communication with teams, which is the only thing that's left behind after your words have left your mouth. All that's left is the memories of what you said, which often those memories are wrong. And the only other thing left is what you've written on the piece of paper. Finally, probably the most important thing I want to leave you with is a different concept of, of DAU. Uh, and I first started, I met with Chris's family. I showed you a picture of Chris, the 17 year old student who developed severe necrotizing pneumonia and sadly died a day or so after his 18th birthday party. And I went to visit Chris at home when, when I wrote the book. Um, I didn't want to change names, change details. I wanted it to be real. Uh, and knocking on his parents' door a decade after Chris had died genuinely was the hardest thing I think I've ever done in my career. Uh, one thing I promised them was that I would include Chris's favourite song in the book because he loved music. Uh, so I went back from that meeting. I spoke to my publisher and I said, oh, good news. I've met with the family. They're happy for the story to be included uh, and I'm going to include the song lyric. And the publisher uh, kind of looked in horror um, and said this word copyright. I don't know what it means. Uh, apparently you can't just do that. Um, but working in medicine, you know, we have to hack our way around things. So I hid it. Uh, so on page 62, the song lyric says, my wish for you is that your dreams stay big, your worries stay small, which is the first word of every other line. Please don't tell the band Rascal Flats. Um, Otherwise, there might be a big bill. Um, but for me, writing that book wasn't to members of the public. It was to Chris. It was to Chris and his family. It was to them. And I think in medicine, we've forgotten that the things we write, yes, they to communicate with other teams, but ultimately, they are for that patient. They are for that family. This isn't a new concept. I wrote about using patient notes addressed to them in the BMJ and then found an article actually which promoted this you know a decade before no no ideas are new and so now when i write notes in the icu not every note but a number of notes i don't address them to the medical team or to the nursing staff or to my colleagues i address them to that patient that can sometimes be hard it can sometimes feel odd i even do it when they are going to die and that can feel really tricky. But now, after doing this for years, it feels weird not to, actually. And I want to give you an example of why not only I think this is the right way to go, but why it may be important for patients too. Um, this is, from the medical notes, a passage I wrote to a patient with severe COVID that was sick enough to die. Uh, and I said to him, I said to his wife by phone, I wrote what I said to her, and this is what I wrote in the notes. I spoke to your wife on the phone today. I told her I was very worried that you were sick enough to die. You have severe lung failure from COVID. Your oxygen levels are dangerously low, despite us using all the treatments that may help. You're on a life support machine, having all the oxygen we can use, and it goes on. This narrative, even to you, you probably know everything about this patient called Avith, just by reading this narrative. And yet there's no medical terms in there. There's no CRP in there. There's no lactate in there. But you know all the treatments we used. You know how ill he was. You know that pronin didn't help. You know that we gave him immune therapy. You know I'm going to refer him for ECMO. And you know he 
perhaps went for Vivi Ekbo, just through a short narrative paragraph with no bullet points. I thought nothing much else of this paragraph, if I'm honest. Uh, the patient went to Guy's, went to London. He had Vivi Ekmo, who's probably the illest patient I've ever managed. Uh, and then some months later, I had the privilege of meeting him again. And when I met him that time, I read the words that I wrote, that I said to his wife from that time. And there's a short video of it that I'm going to show you now. Hello, Dr. Morgan. Nice to meet you. Hello. Hello, all three of you. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yeah, we are all fine. It's, uh, uh, I'm speechless. I'm emotionally speechless to see you. I would like to argue and kiss you, really, for what you have done to save my life. And uh, thank you is not going to be enough for me, really. I reached a point where I couldn't cope at all any longer, and I was pretty frightened because I have never experienced something like that in my life, short of breath, gasping for hair. And that's where I decided to seek expert medical advice. I was scared um, at the beginning, yeah. I used to phone twice a day um, to have news about Davide and I referred everything to our families in Italy. So uh, I was busy, I have to say, but yeah, the waiting was hard. When I entered into the COVID zone in intensive care, I knew there was one patient there who was the sickest. And I knew that because I couldn't see his face. That was because he was laying on his front or prone because the amount of oxygen he was needing was so high and sometimes turning patients onto their front can help. We knew when we turned him onto his back again and his oxygen levels plummeted every time we did it, we knew that the ventilators, the breathing machines we were using wouldn't be enough. They wouldn't be enough for him to survive. And it was at that point where we asked for help from a specialist team in London who provide a service of adding oxygen directly to a patient's blood. And we knew then that that would probably be the only treatment that may save him. They also they kind of trust us, so we didn't have to say anything other than it says hi David. I spoke to your wife again today. I explained that we were delighted you'd return from St. Thomas's after having ECMO. Although you were no longer critically ill, there was still a long road to recovery ahead. But we were so happy that you have your life back, that your wife has her husband back, and that your daughter has her dad back. And uh, yeah, that was that was lovely to say, actually. So Trust thank the, you. Yeah. yeah. Don't know. Don't know what to say. I'm completely speechless. Really. Yeah. Thank you. From my uh, bottom of my heart. Thank you. So for me, that's one reason words have power. The things we write, yes, they for teams, yes, they for colleagues, nurses, for handovers, but ultimately they for patients, they for patients like David. So next time you see a bullet point, imagine me shooting you, turn it into a narrative instead. Think about developing your own stock phrases to balance that nuance of ethics, law and communication. And most of all, next time you write about a patient, try writing to them, not about them. And remember that words have power. Thank you. Uh, 
I could almost feel Ross Fisher nodding with the bullet points there at the back. <laughs> um, some questions. Uh, <laughs> what a fantastic story and what a fantastic uh, uh, way of talking to your patients. I've, as I, I actually work at Guys and Tommy, so it's nice to see the the other side of the of the patients' journeys because they sort of get shipped in and shipped out. Um, any questions from the audience? Ah, yep. I'm not sure if I can articulate this properly, but you you've spoken really nicely, really powerfully about how good this is for patients. But changing the way that we do those notes and use those words, do you think that's potentially protective against the work stress, the burnout, the moral injury that we have as clinicians as well? It was really powerful what you spoke about. It was a really fantastic presentation. Thank you, Simon. Yeah. So you know, the question is: Is this protective against burnout? For, for me, this is burn in. It's the opposite of burnout. I also do a follow up clinic. And uh, for me, when you've had a tough week at the office with death and loss and other things, there is nothing better than seeing that side of things. I think it also humanizes those numbers. Um, but, you know, that comes with risks too. And there was a photo there of somebody giving away a bit of them. I think doing this does take a bit of you too. And, um, you know, just, just seeing David and reading those things, I'm not particularly an emotional guy, but I can, I can feel that because I remembered where I was when I wrote them. I don't remember where I was when I looked at his CRP, um, but I remember where I was when I spoke to his wife. So, yeah, I think like anything, there's a balance. It probably is protective for some, perhaps for others, it can bring down those barriers um, of division, which can perhaps be problematic too. Thanks for the story. It's very powerful indeed. How do you um, how do you feel this impacts the nursing staff? Because I feel there is a gap there also with their time they spend on bedside and with the families, and the time we spend bedside and with the families. Um, and I wonder if these words and the way you write them um, help them as well uh, to vocalize their concerns on the personal level of the patients. Yes, well, I spoke to some nursing staff on the unit about this. I gave a similar talk and I felt oh, I'm going to tell this big, exciting thing. And they were all just sitting there saying, yeah, we, we always do that. If you read nursing staff notes, it's all it's all narrative. Yes, there's there's some data, too, but actually a lot of it is narrative. So I, I think probably the pendulum has swung for medics too far the other way with data and with all the things we've forgotten about that story of Vivi and probably we need to swing that pendulum back now I'm not saying when you refer to ECMO just tell them that your patient is a builder and he's got three children and that's the end of the conversation they still want to know AA gradients and and Murray scores um, so there is a balance but yeah I think nursing staff do this better than us actually Fantastic. Thank, Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. We look forward to hearing you again later in the week. Um, so we're coming up to 10. We are surprisingly slightly ahead of schedule. So we're going to take a half an hour break now and then we're going to come back with more lectures. It'll be a good opportunity if you want to go get your ski boots or skis um, just by the Gornograt station. Uh, they are very good and very helpful there. And don't forget to sign up for the fondue. We'll see you in 30 minutes.
now. Okay, so if we could uh, if we could all get back in, grab your coffees and stuff. So a couple of bits of admin. Um, some of you will have found that uh, your name's not appearing on the database. Don't worry, this is simply a glitch. We've been hacked. No, we haven't been hacked, but it's just a glitch on the database. You will all get your CME and uh, your your certificates. So don't worry if your name hasn't appeared or if you haven't got a badge yet there are a few of us that don't and that will all be sorted out now we're going to carry on with the uh, next set of lectures but before that we've got uh, a couple of announcements um, first of all here on my left is a very small and compact ultrasound faculty um, and and Ross is also going to have a twitch at you but I'll hand over to the ultrasound people first yeah hello good morning I know why you're here I mean big sick is a great conference and all but we're here for the world's best ultrasound workshop and it starts today at one o'clock sharp um, so you have some time to grab some food and come back here and we have of course the world's best ultrasound ultrasound workshop with best models available on the market and we have a lot of crazy machines back there in uh, the room so be prepared come back grab something to eat and we'll start here at one o'clock sharp we have an excellent faculty here, world's best faculty, in fact. And um, yeah, we have prepared something from really beginner stuff to advanced, so it's something in it for every one of you. Come back, one o'clock, no sign up needed, and in three hours you will be the best ultrasonographers in the world. So I'm not gonna add much to that, uh, just agree to everyone you, uh, you said. So we have a, a kind of um, a nice we're going to scan lungs, we're going to scan heart, we're going to do trauma ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound. We have some cool simulators for you for cases and stuff like that. And we just love being here every year and do scanning together with you. So please uh, show up at one o'clock. Thank you. Ross, are you in the room? Mr. Fisher? Ah, do you want to tell them about your workshop on the mountain? Ah, okay, so we'll, we'll come back to that a bit later. Okay, so um, there's no sign up for the ultrasound workshop, but there is sign up for the fondue. And it's not a workshop, fondue is purely an experience, and an experience that's worth it. So let's uh, get back to the, the lectures and the science. So um, our next speaker uh, is Jason Fantefeld. He's from Cork. Uh, and he's an emergency physician and a pre-hospital care physician. He's a vice chair of the pre-hospital emergency um, care society of uh, Ireland, and he's a clinical lead for the Irish telemedicine service. Um, he's also an instructor on ATAC, and has a wealth of experience both in education and clinical applications in the pre-hospital setting. Now, I've been told that he's going to talk about Oh, um, ventilation and cardiac arrest again. Uh, all right, well, I'll hand you over to him then. Good. Yeah, this, is, this one's for Ross. Um, I, I, I'm going to speak about some complexities of advanced respiratory care, and I've got a few objections and objectives to go through. And, um, you know... How rude. How rude. Oh, come on. No, 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 come on. No, no. Look, um, a title slide like that's usually my cue to head out to the back, grab a friend, grab a questionable cup of coffee, and, uh, you know, get here. Yeah, and look, hands up, guys, and be honest, right? How many of you are totally unmotivated to hear another conference talk about bloody cardiac arrest? <laughs> right? Thank you. <clears throat> Hands up if you absolutely cringe at even the thought of going on an advanced life support course. Oh, thank goodness. Hands up if you have very little motivation in even attending a cardiac arrest call. Okay, so look, decision time. That's a blank slide. 
skill presentation, okay? Because if I was to drone on about respiratory physiology, even in, a, in, a, in an animated kind of way, you'd rather be skiing, right? Yeah, okay. So would you like to hear how your patient in a refractory rhythm could relatively reliably have non-invasive saturations like that? Enabling you to easily bridge your patient, face a young male in refractory VF for 30 minutes, to definitive interventions. So if you want reliable sats like that in a rest, stay and listen to my little Irish tale. And it is an Irish tale, okay? This is, this is a great team. This is Team Rural National Average. Great people, great. It's moving on by itself, by the way. Yeah. Um, team Rural National Great intentions, okay? And we had a ROSC on arrival to hospital rate hovering around 18% when this photo was taken in the pandemic. And there's a word, uh, an Irish word, ehel. All tradition, where people in rural communities gather together on the neighbor's farm, gather in the hay, gather in the crops, everybody would help each other. All right? They acted as a team. It's still moving on by itself. And, um, and really coming together when somebody is sick and injured. And since 2012, our increased 84%, the highest in Europe. 10% of defibrillation attempts happen pre-EMS arrival, the highest in Europe. And we've had 10,000, that's if you've been in the audience, voluntary community first response activations last year, per capita, the highest in Europe. I can go on and on and on the list of Irish achievements against guidelines, against best international consensus guidelines, means that Team Ireland are the poster child for the Resuscitation Council. We do everything asked of us, and yet our cardiac arrest outcomes are disproportionately average. And despite pouring our hearts and souls into achieving Resuscitation Council guidelines, our ROSC on arrival to hospital rate nationally has only increased by 1% years. Pretty much you guys, yeah? Yeah. This still goes on automatically. But you guys know this. There are even available guidelines, all right, doesn't reliably do what it's intended to do. What is CPR intended to do? This is the chain of survival as currently specialists or advocates, a successful resuscitation relying on two critical factors. That's optimizing the no flow time, in other words, when there's no CPR, and optimizing the low flow time. And that is until ROSC or some, you know, definitive intervention has been enabled like the eCPR or, or, or PCI or something like that. And our team has spent the last four years reshifting our focus in cardiac arrest management to optimize that low flow time. And basically, through automated CPR. So before I begin, can we just get a few things into perspective? Can we all agree that there's no, just like in trauma, there is no silver bullet out there for management of cardiac arrest, yeah? Great, okay. We all know that cardiac arrest, many hidden tr triggers, go well beyond some erratic, easily defibrillatable piece of muscle, yeah? Okay. And every single human being, every single patient is completely different. It takes time to adequately explore and discover the underlying cause of an arrest. And this being preoccupied with some physically and mentally demanding algorithm is the worst possible use of that time. And accurate diagnosis, and I'm not even come to management here, requires a little bit of CRM tranquility, a little bit of headspace. Now, do you all agree that it's entirely logical, although not always practical, to adopt strategies that optimize the low flow state. Yeah? Okay. Now, eCPR, ultimate time machine, a conflict of interest. I, I, I'm a huge advocate and a huge admirer of Lionel and Alice and their work in Paris. But there's a problem. Optimizing this low flow state or bridging a patient to eCPR remains a massive challenge to its implementations. I always thought that that, that would be our problem in rural Ireland. But it's actually the first thing that gets taught on, on any sort of ECMO course. You've got to have an optimized low flow state. 
do you all acknowledge that there's aspects of accepted practice, in other words, any intervention that pauses the CPR, that's at odds with optimizing end organ perfusion and oxygenation? Yep. Okay. Fully automated CPR requires automated ventilation. So why is automated ventilation not a thing? Why did mechanical C sorry, why did why did mechanical ventilation during CPR not even mention in the AHA guidelines that are published in, in November? It's simple. In all the research on intra arrest ventilation thus far to date, providing any ventilation during arrest is either inefficient or harmful. Okay? So whether we pause to ventilate with an unsecured airway, we provide asynchronous ventilations with a secured airway, current ventilation strategies by the guidelines inflict uncontrollable airway pressures, reduce perfusion, and increasingly we're becoming aware of this thing called functional residual capacity. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. In other words, we actually aren't ventilating anything more than bronchioles. Hmm. Do you know what? If I forget this, take this out, and I'll just signal for you to change it, all right? A question for you. What happens that button on events as I get myriad of, of, of different manufacturers out there and everything does things slightly differently but what principally happens so the ventilator provides synchronous IPPV to what a set rate in accordance to guidelines okay to do this what do you have to deactivate yeah the trigger the ventilator trigger and you have to deactivate the alarm so it won't piss you off yeah okay are newer devices any better? No. All they do is they simply display, change the display on a screen to do what? Help you with consistent what? Guidelines. Okay, I provide a critical care resource in a very large rural area. And even in the city, even with 292 day horsepower, thanks to Team Rural Island, guideline compliant resuscitation with defibrillation has already taken place. As a critical care resource, I've got to bring something else to the party, all right? I've got to, I've got to have a completely clean slate, all right? Just as, as, as previous speakers have talked about. Well, hey. There we go. I've got to bring something else to the scene. I've got to look beyond the guidelines that haven't worked for this patient in front of me already. My guys are really good. They're doing it all already. It's not worked in this patient. So I've got to start with this clean space. And this is a stable placeholder of fully automated CPR. A placeholder whilst we figure out what has caused the arrest in the first place. And then, only once this picture becomes clearer, only once the cause of the arrest, the diagnosis becomes apparent. Still doing it. All right. Only once the, as it becomes apparent, do I take the first steps in trying to manage it. And it's this sort of thing, leap of faith. Faith that we haven't had before in the optimization of that low flow state. And I'm going to throw a pebble into your pond. And I do so really in the hope that it just gen generates a bit of discussion. I'm quite happy for some quite lively banter and discussion. We need robust discussion surrounding ventilation and cardiac arrest. So what does CCSV stand for? Now, a clue is on this patient's monitor. So apart from the patient being in VF with near normal oxygen saturations, blood pressure, and end tidal CO2, the respiratory rate equals the chest compression rate and is synchronized with each compression. And you can see trace. Chest compression synchronized ventilation. Yeah. Okay. Right. Manually, there we go. All right. Well, hey. Yeah. There we go. We found we found the problem. Jesus, I was doing okay then for a minute. Hey. Okay. Slow. Oh yeah. Fix one problem, start another one. There we go. 
No. So have you guys had sats like that in the rest? Anybody? Whilst they're still in VF? It's an interesting fusion state. That's optimized in the low flow state. And that's just a standard non-invasive monitoring. That's just standard blood pressure cuff sats. I feel like we need some music here and a bit of river dance, you know, trying to get things going. There we go, just throw it there. Swap the screen. No, swap the screen. Swap the screen there, so where it's up there. Current monitor, and use presenter notes. Okay. Well, hey, we're back. Okay. <coughs> Chest compression, synchronized ventilation. Hey. Look, right. Pushy hard and fast in the chest time. Chest compressions generally small, but detectable tidal. And during the downstroke of hands only CPR, intrathoracic pressure increases. Right? Blood is propelled out the heart, towards the lungs, the brains, the rest of the body. You all know this. This is ex Hailed as the lungs get squashed. So the downstroke equals exhalation. Right. During the recoil of the chest, the upstroke, a negative pressure creates a vacuum effect. You know this shit already, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Upstroke is inhalation. These tidal volumes, right, they're small. They're below functional residual or closing capacity, and this is the critical thing. Realistically, we're only ve ventilating dead space. But you can detect it if you've got a clever enough flow sensor. When the airway is secure and from the ventilator, those unique waveforms generated by chest compressions are detectable flow sensors. And software interprets the signal and directs the ventilator to produce a 205 millisecond pressure regulated breath completely downstroke. And that's important. In plain English, CPR is its own synchronous ventilatory trigger. Chest compression synchronized ventilation. And this intrathoracic pressure becomes increasingly positive during the downstroke. Greatly enhancing perfusion, the effects of, uh, of compression. A true systole, if you like. And because the intrathoracic pressure is the greatest at the end of the compression phase, gas escapes during recoil. The opposite of conventional CPR, and this is really important because that provides that really negative intrathoracic pressure that other people have been trying for years and years. Okay, pressure pulling all blood back in, or greatly improving coronary artery perfusion, a true diastole, if you like. So what? Okay. So remember, we were team rural national average, hovering at 18% rostrum arrival to hospital rate for all cause arrest. Then COVID happened. And infection control measures mandated that we had to have a filtered closed circuit with, with anybody we were ventilating. We simply had to solve the problem of CPR aerosoling into the cabin. So we thought about giving TCSV a mode that was actually on our existing services ventilator. We just never used it before. I was a very cautious early adopter, and everybody knows I'm a cautious early adopter. <laughs> okay, and to be fair, I only wanted to solve the aerosoling problems 
And by simply adding CCSV to existing Irish pre-hospital emergency care council guidelines, doing nothing else, we improved our ROSC on arrival to hospital rate to 27% in a pandemic. Oh. <laughs> They're never perfect. Okay. I responded to at least in the last four years, at least 150, uh, you know, another 25 on top of that since I started this FACPR journey. And in all the cases, we're seeing some pretty unusually well perfused pink patients. They started breathing back at us. And despite them still being in arrest, CPR induced consciousness wasn't something we had to be just aware of, it's something we had to be ready for. And we were getting startlingly invasive blood pressures without adrenaline. And we thought, wow. But something was still not right, you see, because in some people it just worked, and in other people it was disproportionately average. So responding to cardiac arrest became an interesting clinical challenge for me. You know, there were now calls that I wanted to go to again because I wanted to try and solve this problem in my own practice. They weren't the chickens, you know, and, and, and they, they weren't for headstrong cocks either, right? We were starting to step outside the guidelines. We were starting to appreciate the automated um, CPR. To have it actually happen and become a thing, we had to the individual patient. Oh my goodness, guidelines don't work for everybody. We started to appreciate that patients got ROSC more reliably when we got equal ventricular flow patterns, both positive and negative on the ventilator screen, with the tidal volumes at about a quarter of what you would normally set, and end tidal CO2 about a third of what you normally produce. And we're trying to reach this state reliably. How do we do this? I mean, our BLS providers showed us the way. They were the first to start to game the screens. Because and they realized better nerves meant pinker patients and more reliable ROS. Our firefighters started resus gaming. They were watching these screens, watching the infusion happen, going, all right, push harder, push faster. They were doing more. They were altering depth, recoils, the force they were using, using live feedback. Now, gaming resus aside, uh, I'm convinced that human factors reform actually played the, the greatest role in our success in 2021. Because with our firefighters, you know, handling the ventilator and the pinking up patient bit, the critical team were able to think. We had bandwidth. CRM win for us. We had the headspace to go into diagnostics and then make choices about referral and onward pathways. And our roster arrival to hospital rate increased to 32% that year. The skeptics were looking at us going, huh? They started asking for data and evidence. Of course they did. And this is the sort of typical beat to beat stuff we can download from our ventilator. I know what the ventilator is producing. I know there's the PK wave pressure at the top, the flows, that 205 millisecond breath there, and the waveform entitled CO2. This is what chest compression synchronized ventilation looks like when we, when we, look, when we make it graphically. And it began causing us to think a lot more we started to map these things against real time. What was the paramedic, what was the doctor doing at the time? And so in this example, while synchrony is maintained, there's variations in flow and pressure. Why? But well, that's mechanical. That's manual CPR on the go. Here, for example, the flow is predominantly positive. There's not enough gas escaping from the chest. Why? Well, when you go back and you look at the data and you can iteratively improve your team doing this, orientate you three and a half minutes of CPR on the go there, and you'll notice that pressure predominantly going negative, the flow predominantly trending positive. And then what is that down to? The paramedic getting tired and resting on the chest with manual. All right. So now we're able to do things and think about what we're doing. Well, there's your pause for, for putting on the mechanical CPR. No, very long, I know, but I mean, good quality flow after that. Our biggest concern when we started this journey surrounded about pressures and the potential for lung injury. This is CCSV in a 12 kilogram child. Peak pressures and mean pressures, well accepted parameters, particularly given the emotiveness of the, the, the manual CPR. I know exactly what pressure they're putting into this little boy's chest, exactly. And then this same boy is can switch over to IPPV. Analyzing flow and pressure data, range of research opportunities that we don't even know where we are yet. 
And incidentally, being able to download ventilatory data, we're able to compare the differences, for example, between CCSV and IPPV. You can do pig studies on this. That's not my study, but you can show how um, perfusion is improved. And just using data to develop our techniques, we started to achieve a 39% ROSC and arrival to hospital rate in 2022 from all cause arrest. We were getting somewhere. 2023, this last year, it's been the year of the compression. There's evidence that manual CPR is not inferior to mechanical. Tr traditionally, we slogged it up the mountain. Grant, okay. Depending on circumstances, we don't rush to start mechanical CPR either. But autism in our practice just seems to make it doesn't get. You, you, it's not subject to human variability. You could provide heads up CPR. You could safely transfer a patient downstairs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's easier to intubate, and let's not forget it provides much better stable conditions for putting really large lines in. Now, mechanical CPR was never the missing link in Ireland because we have a 53% use of it. Anyway, every ambulance has mechanical CPR in Ireland, every single response car. So it wasn't what it, it wasn't our missing link. How we use mechanical CPR was, how we use it is important. So by analyzing those flows and pressures, we see that not two mechanical CPR devices are created equally. Two different devices, exactly the same patient, by the way, we ran out of batteries on one of them, all right? So we have the same patient, different flows. What does it mean? Who knows? I'm not here to sell a particularly mechanical CPR brand, but answer me this one question. How obese can your device reliably go? Incidentally, if you see the ripples in that, that's, that's fat. And you can see the ripples of fat on those pressure curves. He's a regular at park runs on Saturday. Can you change the rate your mechanical CPR does?
bring you, it will take us at least 70 minutes. Is this like a, oh, that, that one's a bit better. We knew it will take at least 70 minutes to get a profoundly hypothermic patient in a rest to hospital, temperature 27 degrees. That's really cold for us in Ireland. So we suspended for all further activities as per guidelines. We started CCSV, fully automated. Compare the skin color of the patient with critical care paramedic. Look how bright his arterial blood is. I know he's perfusing. Incidentally, we don't shy away from endovascular um, monitoring or endovascular approaches at all. In fact, gaining access is so much easier with fully automated CPR. And I believe that fully automated CPR with CCSV is that stable platform that those endovascular procedures are yearning for, getting those patients to ECMO. This is our profoundly hypothermic patient. This is the patient in transit. All right. Fully automated. We're just sitting there, clipped in, you know, telling the wife we're going to be late. He has a snapshot of his small volume, controlled, rapidly oscillating, ventrally flows and pressure over a five minute period, stable. CCSV is analogous to an oscillator, a well kind of accepted ventrally modality. As in oscillatory ventilations, tidal volumes and end tidal CO2 are low. However, the efficiency of ventilation is because those small tidal volumes are multiplied by the respiratory rate, which in this case is the chest compression rate. Here is his arterial blood gases. I took one hour, 40 minutes after commencing fully automated CPR. He's still in arrest here. Look at the lactate, look at the potassium. All right. He's perfusing. And with his lactate like that, looking like that, that's an easy sell to our cardiothoracic surgeons who went, right, we have a go. And in Cork, that means go up to cardiac theater, go on to bypass. Now, fortunately, they had a heart on the table. So it took us three hours to get him on to bypass. So there he is, went on to bypass, three hours post arrest. And despite being in a non perfusion rhythm for over three hours, having bridged him to ECMO, with CCSV, he was successfully rewarmed and defibrillated. And this gentleman was discharged to a psychiatric unit less than a week later, fully neurologically and physically intact. I can only tell you our Irish story. I'm happy to take any questions as time is tight. Happy to see you on the ski slopes or in the bar tonight. And hopefully you can influence your practice. Thank you. I'll pass you that back for uh, for questions. Right. Questions? Ah, yep. Um. Yeah, thanks for the lecture. Um, so you can start with a question about Hi. A question to you or maybe to the partners in the back. I don't know. Um, is there an approach to link all the uh, involved devices um, and use all the available data on scene to improve uh, depth, um, frequency of compressions, it does. volumes and stuff maybe on an... No, it does already. And the intrinsic link isn't a, and this is the beauty of it, it's not some wider Bluetooth Gucci, you know, technology which always fails, all right? It is simply, the machine is detecting what you're doing and then and you see it graphically. So if you're doing it well, you will see it going on the screen. So we do, that's what the firefighters are doing. They're gaming that screen. They're looking at those positive and negative flows. So we know when we get to that stage that, that we've optimized things. And we have non-invasive blood pressure, just normal non-invasive blood pressure and normal SATs. It's all we need. You saw all those examples, SATs well into the 90s. Great. Yeah. Um, you already mentioned that you do get a lot of CPR-induced consciousness in these patients, naturally. So what's your concept for that? There's nothing you can't do with a good uh, neuroprotective anesthetic. So that's all we do. Thank you for your story. Um, um, the ventilator mode, I hadn't heard of it, to be honest. Was it difficult to, or was it, how was the learning curve? 
Okay, so you saw the learning curve there, guys. It's four, it took me four years to figure it out. Okay, we have, and you know, in, in collaboration with the company that, that makes the event later, we are now thinking about how we train the trainer. Okay, because there is a definite learning curve. We had a step well out of the guidelines. If you just add it on, you saw 27% was our scraped. But to add it on and then change how we individualize, you know, CPR, resuscitative care for an individual patient, that's what took a time to figure out. So that's why none of this has been published yet. None of this is anything, right? We, we took time. But you see where we've got to. Thank you for the talk, Jason. Uh, about the transport times, I'm thinking of transferring your approach to like more city areas. Uh, what's your like shortest transport time for these type of patients? I mean, like it's it's around the corner, around the world for us. I mean, this is rural island. I mean, I've got some places where it takes me. I, I I'll never ever forget responding to a postpartum hemorrhage on blue lights, two hours twenty minutes, and I was the first on scene. Um, you know, so like we have huge transport times. But then we also have cities, like like you have in Stockholm. You know, so, so it's it's. Um, but do you do? But the you, point do you is do? right. Mm -hmm. the po and, and and you know, like Lionel Lamont makes this point really, really clear. Why does he do ECMO in Paris? Because they're three stories up, tiny staircases. You can't talk about time from that point there to that point there. It's how long it takes to get that person out the bathroom, down the stairs, around that court. You know, and then that's not even taken into account that they might be supersized. You know, so it's really difficult to move people. Thank you. Um, it's a question for me. So oh, yeah. the the rates of um, ROSC, has that been maintained post-pandemic? So I was just wondering, is there, is there a confounder in the pathology behind the arrests during the pandemic? Okay, so during pandemic, we only really got to 27%, then 32%, but we're now maintaining at just below 50%. I'm desperately trying to get over 50%, but it's, yeah. That's fantastic. That's absolutely amazing. And, and the other thing is, uh, again, sort of looking at the international audience here, not all services can provide intubation uh, for, for cardiac Very good patients. Question. So what happens then? So in the early years, we were trying this as well. We were trying not to meddle too much. So our paramedic providers in Ireland all use King LTs, okay? So superglottic devices. So we try to not meddle. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the leak is it just makes it unreliable. So when I get there, I intubate. To do this okay it just it's, it's far more reliable so it's mandated that you have to intubate them to put on that mode or if you if you if you yes okay it is mandated but guys are we all <laughs> mandate guideline followers here yay of course nay. <laughs> right but <laughs> end of the day we've tried it it doesn't work as well okay it really doesn't intubation yeah fantastic thank you so much an amazing talk I'm sure many of these conversations will continue on the mountain and at the bar as they as they should. Um, so our next speaker is Ian Braithwaite. He's a paediatric transport nurse. He's fairly new to the job, 20 plus years experience, I think, in UK uh, and in Australia. Um, so I think in Australia, I guess, you know, long transport times. Um, he's an educator. He um, works for Embrace. He also runs his own course as well. Um, and he tries to teach uh, the standard of what should happen in, in neonatal transportation and paediatric transportation. Um, we've talked about the general guidelines in the previous talk and the, and the big broad brush sort of guidance and actually how that can be modulated into a far more precise approach with the ventilation to improve your outcomes. And I think Ian's going to carry on on that, albeit on a smaller note because they are neonates, but looking at precision in neonatal transport. Thank you. I kind of thought I'd get to hold the notes and then they give you a mic in one hand and a button in the other. No, I'll be fine. I should have been like, thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me down here. Yes, I'm talking about precision in neonatal transport. And I'm going to talk about a patient who I've I've made up. Um, this is Bobby. Bobby is a uh, about 800 grams, 28 weeker, born in a sort of semi-rural hospital in England in on the seaside in Scarborough. Um, I was looking for a good photo of a... Um, a premature baby and I was struggling and my wife said well why don't you use one of our sons so that is actually my son um, and I'm a neonatal nurse I'm a pediatric nurse 
we love precision. You only get to do this job if you are obsessive, compulsive, and passionate about the detail. And that is very useful because thinking about the topic of the whole conference, about the sickest patients, the, few, the earliest hours, for neonatal medicine, the first three days are so important. Uh, some of you may have heard of a, a challenge we have um, in ventricular hemorrhage of the newborn, which are these small bleeds you get um, in the germinal matrix in the newborn brains. And they often, when they happen, they tend to happen in the first three days. They happen to 20 to 40 percent of neonatal extremely premature patients. And we still don't have a clear idea about why they occur. We don't have a clear idea about how to prevent them. What we do know is they can and do adversely influence the outcome of these patients. So we really want to be able to, to manage these. And one of the ways that we can do that to the best of our ability at the moment, because it's still a very gray area, is by precision. Now, if you were nursing this patient in the hospital, you might have a, a care bundle of practices the individual evidence for each of these practices may not be that strong, but collected together as a bundle, these they have been shown to improve um, outcome. You might um, focus on putting the head in the midline, um, elevating the patient, being very precise about your administration of medications, sample your arterial line very slowly, minimize stress and pain, um, tight control of arterial CO2, and tight control of oxygen saturations. And if you want to hear about a really interesting study, ask me about the oxygen saturation study, how we discovered the right sats to keep these babies at. Um, but you've got this baby beautifully cared for by you know obsessive compulsive doctors and nurses in this beautifully clean neonatal unit. And then if I walk up to it, start shaking the incubator, kicking the wheels and yelling at it, you'd call the police, you'd restrain me. But actually, that's what I'm doing as a transport nurse. I'm taking this baby out of this lovely place and I'm creating chaos. And how can I keep that bundle going? How can I keep precision going on this journey and improve their outcome? So I'm gonna look at three little ways that we've tried to do it in my service. Um, precision and ventilation management, precision and medication delivery, and precision in the journey itself. If we start with precision and ventilation management, we've got that target of um, tight arterial um, CO2 control because you don't want, because these babies' brains are so sensitive to um, uh, changes in oxygenation that result from changes in CO2 levels. And we've got a good integrated network of transport units in the UK and we benchmark heavily against each other. Um, back in 2015, 2016, my team, we're not very good at naming services, um, unfortunately. Um, there's some terrible acronyms down there. But we were above the national mean, which for this metric, which is the number of transports where the gas at the end, the blood gas at the end of transport was outside the range four to seven kPa. We wanted to get better than that. We weren't very happy with ourselves. The first thing we did was we bought some fancy new ventilators that meant that we could monitor tidal volumes and have some more precise control. And that did give us a small bump where the, the line above um, the national mean was still dropping, but we sort of accelerated a little bit. But we wanted to do better than that because, as you can see, we just plateaued for the years after. We came up against some challenges based around the, the technical complexities of ventilating patients like Bobby, who were just 800 grams. For your adult, <coughs> you've got uh, various bits and pieces on your vent circuit that make up the instrumental dead space. I've estimated at about 85 mils here, but they've got a tidal volume of, of half a litre, so that doesn't really matter. It's only sort of 10 to 20% of their tidal volume. And if we look at what we're doing for Bobby here, I mean, Bobby might have five mils of dead space, but I'm ventilating Bobby at five mils per kilo. His, dead, his you know, tidal volume is five mils. The dead space I'm trying to manage um, is 100% of this tidal volume. It's just an area where we think we could possibly be a little more precise. So from left to right, I've got my Y piece, I've got my heat moisture exchanger, I've got my flow sense, I've got my own tidal. The first thing we can do is take out the heat moisture exchanger because we're always using warmed gases on these patients. Um, but that does leave us with the, the entidal connector at the end. And we, are, we were using entidal both as, you know, it's the gold standard in transport, 
it tells you your tubes in, but also we're following the numbers to keep our, um, to manage our ventilation in terms of uh, CO2 levels. But in our patient population, how accurate was that? So we did a little audit. This is 13 babies. If the end tidal um, was accurate compared to the arterial CO2, those red dots should be on the blue line in the middle, or at least lined up in something sort of parallel where we could say there was a relationship. But it just didn't seem to be a good relationship in our patients. And yet this was a number which our clinicians are staring at and tweaking the ventilator for on some quite long transports. And yes, you know, we can pull over and we can do a blood gas on the journey, but you know, if you do that constantly, you're never going to get there. So we took something which was coming back into to fashion on the neonatal units and we put it on our transport systems, which is transcutaneous monitoring. Um, and this is a tool where by putting a sensor on the patient, warming that sensor, you're vascularizing, you're um, bringing the arterial blood flow closer to the surface and clever engineering can give you a number. Um, and we put this on our transport systems and same group of patients looking at the accuracy of the transcutaneous number. It was really impressive. We did not expect that. Um, very little variation and it just didn't take any convincing to make that the standard of care for our transports. And that really reflected as well in the improvement in our ability to keep the patients within that four to seven KPA range. We did wonder if we could do better than that. What if we took out the entire CO2 altogether? There's a bit of nervousness about this because it tells you the tubes in, but we also felt that even though we were telling them not to, people were still looking at the numbers. It's very difficult to ignore a number and it's not easy just to put a bit of tape on the monitor. So we did that. We did a, a lot of education. We focus on the flow loops on the ventilator. If you've got negative flow, your tube is in. And we had a color metric indicator um, on top of the ventilator. So if you had an emergency, if you're intubating, you had something you could use quickly. And I haven't got the numbers for that, but I really do think that is the next step in our improvement. I'm talking about precision and medication delivery. I, I demonstrated this slide to one of the conference faculty a few weeks ago and um, he swore very loudly because I don't think he was used to having to give three meals an hour of maintenance to a patient. You can't just hang a bag up on these patients and open the tap. Um, Bobby needs 90 mils per kilo per day on his first day of life. That's 72 mils a day, which is three meals an hour. And what's that made out of? Well, Bobby needs a bit of morphine, a bit of muscle relaxing. Um, he's got an arterial line, we need to put a flush on that. No pressure bag in these patients. Um, maybe a bit of dopamine or adrenaline and the rest maintenance, so three mils an hour. But we're asking our infusion pumps to run at some very low rates. And the question that's been asked by some of my colleagues is, how good are they at doing that on transport? The first question they asked was, static height of the pump relative to the patient matter. So these are just sketches of our road systems, the green bits of the pumps. We've got road systems, we've got pumps below the patient, we've got pumps above the patient. On our air systems, we've got pumps at the foot of the patient, we've got pumps above the patient. They're in different places on each of our trolleys. Um, does it matter? The quick answer is no, it doesn't matter at all, the static height difference of your pump. But what about moving the pump because we're always sometimes taking pumps that are already running on patients so to at different heights moving them across um, this graph looks at moving a pump down 50 centimeters uh, so if you've got a pump that's running at two mils an hour moving it down 50 centimeters it's like stopping that pump for two minutes but as you saw before we're not running that pump at, at two mils an hour we're running that pump at half a mil an hour so if i take my brawn pump that's running at half a mil an hour, move it down 50 centimetres. That's like stopping it for 12 minutes. And if I had a setup where I raised that pump up 50 centimetres, again, that's like giving a 12 minute bolus of whatever I'm infusing. So that is something we have to be very careful about. And we have to, wherever possible, keep things at the same height. I was, had a very sick patient the other day and when you get to the other end at the hospital, you're saying, right, I want this infusion to be at the same height it is on my transport system. I know your lovely unit has the pumps, you know, up here or down on the floor, but let's keep them the same for now. 
and you can change them slowly later. We also asked, does vibration matter? These pumps here on this system, it's the pump on the right, my, uh, your right, is just fixed. The pump on the left is mounted to a fancy sort of film camera gimbal that stabilizes the footage. And uh, my colleague drove that round and round uh, to look at, does vibration matter? Does it influence how much medication comes out of these things? And the answer is yes, it does. Um, the blue line, the pump without the stabilizing device, um, started off faster than the pump um, that was stabilized and the optimal expected situation was the green line. But actually after about five minutes, everything st settled down and the lines converged, which was reassuring. This is a crazy picture. This is, does orientation of the pump matter? So the same group of precision orientated colleagues fitted pumps pointing up, pumps pointing down, pumps mounted transversely, pumps pointing backwards, pumps pointing forwards, and wanted and ran everything at a very low rate to see, was there any difference? There was a difference. If the pump is pointing in the direction of travel, so, you know, you are squeezing the pump and you're heading in that direction, that's the green line. You get more out of that pump. If your pump is transversely mounted, so, the, you know, it is just traveling parallel to the direction of transport, you get the lines which best fit what you expect going up. And that didn't converge to a steady state over the journey. It came out of the pump, which was mounted in the direction of travel. Second worst was the pump, which was mounted going backwards. Um, so there's a bit of head scratching about this because, you know, this is our one of our se helicopter setups here. Um, if this is loaded in the aircraft as it looks here, those pumps are pointing in the direction of travel, you'd get a little bit more out of that pump. Um, whereas if you loaded that setup transversely in the aircraft, the pumps are transverse, uh, you get a, more what the manufacturer tells you you should expect to get. And there's another setup here we've got for fixed wing transport. The pumps, and this is coincidental, this was how they fitted when it was designed, the pumps are mounted transversely. So if you're going, you know, straight ahead, that's a great way to mount them. If you loaded this system transversely in the aircraft or the ambulance, the pumps are suddenly pointing in the direction of travel. So we had to think very carefully about how we start to design our new systems. Um, we've got a road system on the way where actually we've put the pumps on a little turntable because you know we're not entirely convinced how this is all going to play out but we're keeping our options open so we can point them wherever we want to point them we did ask this is all done on 50 mil syringes and we um pat my colleague patrick at the bottom and i really recommend contacting him if you want any more on this because he's putting a lot of effort on this 20 mil syringes versus 50 mil syringes a lot of the previous effects i've talked about actually are mitigated by using a smaller syringe because you've got a far faster plunger speed. And if you calculate some models of serum concentrations, this is a, a beta active drug with a 90 second half-life. You know, the effect that we saw on the vibration earlier just disappears. So it's not always practical, but you know, we are making all our infusions up that are running less than a mil an hour in these 20 mil syringes. Um, I was told that you were all geeks and all I had to be was geeky. So I hope that's geeky enough. Um, I also told the guy sitting next to to take the odd photo of me and it just makes it look like there's someone really interested, which is quite cool. <laughs> and the last thing to talk about is precision and the journey itself. So Bobby, Bobby's born in Scarborough, little seaside town in the, um, in the northeast of, of England in Yorkshire. We've got two options for the the level three neonatal unit, we can take him down to Hull, we can take him up to Middlesbrough, James Cook Hospital. It's not a, you know, by the scale of things, it's not long, it's 90 minutes, it's only 50 miles. Um, but it's a really rubbish journey. I mean, the roads are awful and in holiday time, they're very busy. There's lots of stopping and starting. They're not comfortable by any measure. But all those three places have got great helipads and we've got the option of flying. It's 40 miles, it's only 20 minutes. Um, we've got the partners and the equipment to do that. And the question we're all asking ourselves is, is that a good use of our resource? Is that a good use of air transport for this patient? Because 
we're happy to fly patients to London and to Scotland and to collect patients from Cornwall, but this is you know, a fairly local distance in our own patch. Um, and this is a sort of active question um, where we are. Uh, it's worth stepping aside just forces that these um, we're putting these babies under. We've got a sort of shock force, which is where you're you're driving a bump maybe um, <coughs> in the ambulance. You've got the acceleration, which is the change in velocity over a period of time. Um, you might experience it when you brake suddenly or go round a roundabout, and then vibration, which is sustained rhythmic accelerations, uh, engine, tire, road surface noises from road transport. The one thing that neonatal transport practitioners love to do is they love to measure things. We're always measuring things. Um, here's a vibration sensor stuck in a mannequin. Um, I've done this for real patients as well. Um, we, it's a lot easier to measure things and publish it than it is to find a solution to, to the problem. Um, <coughs> this is a great paper, it's a very recent French paper where common to all these measurement papers, you know, they're looking at average vibration in, in the different modes of transport. And you can see the average vibration for the ambulance transport, 0.32 meters per second squared, is a lot less than the average vibration for the helicopter. But what I thought was interesting about this paper and what's been taken up in other studies was they also looked at the number of shock events, the number of bumps and bangs and high impulse events. And they found that the ambulance in this had 44 shocks uh, versus eight in the helicopter, and they were different durations. So it's basically for the ambulance, one impulsive event every two minutes, and the helicopter, one impulsive event over 11 minutes. So basically five times more shocks in the road journey than in the helicopter. And the authors are postulating that we maybe shouldn't focus all the time on just the average vibration of the journey, but look at these high impulse events, which have the potential to impact um, Bobby's journey. And you can see, you know, another study out of Tokyo where they're just measured, this is just a measure of one journey. I thought it was nicely presented. They're taking a baby from Kyoto to Tokyo, they take the baby up to the rooftop, they put them in a helicopter, they fly, they land for a refuel, they fly in the helicopter, and then when they put them in the road ambulance at the other end, and you've got impulse shocks that four to five times the average vibration you've got in the helicopter. And as someone who's flown babies, you know, in Australia and in America and in the UK and in Europe, often the worst part of the journey is that short road journey you have to get to the helipad or to the airport. And the baby who's been perfectly well behaved physiologically in the air suddenly starts to deteriorate as you're focused, as you're faced with all these different changes in dynamics and forces. And there's been a couple of nice studies um, coming out of Northern England, coming out of the Northwest, where they're saying that what these babies like is static forces. They're okay with a bit of vibration. They're not okay with the changes in acceleration and the changes. So what does precision look like for this, for Bobby and his journey between Scarborough and wherever he's going? Well, something which I think is fascinating, this is what precision looks like to me. This is a team um, just south of us who are moving babies all the time between Nottingham, and Leicester by road. Um, they're only about an hour away, these two cities, but they've got a smartphone in the, in the ambulance attached to the neonatal incubator. That smartphone tells them the speed, the acceleration forces, the vibration, the noise, um, and they plot it. So these are all the different ways to get from Leicester to Nottingham. The driver's allowed to drive whichever way they want. And what we discovered was the ways that the driver says the quietest, the quickest, and the smoothest are not actually the quietest, the quickest, and the smoothest. And they can figure out what the most optimal route is, and it varies on the time of day and the day of the week between any two hospitals in their region. I think that's fantastic, and to me that is just a great example of what precision looks like in the journey for patients. So, conclude, and I just credit to my colleague for, for pointing this out. But for me, you know, neonatal transport is a lot like this bobsleigh team here. The sickest patients, the, the earliest hours. These races are won and lost in the first few seconds, in the start off, in, you know, in that initial pound down the track when they're jumping into the bobsleigh. And for the, the care of Bobby, you know, 
a good, outf a good outcome for Bobby is won and lost in the first three days of life. And if he has to spend some of that first three days in an ambulance or a helicopter, we've got to make sure that we're doing the best we can. And if we do the best we can, Bobby ends up looking like this, which is my nine-year-old son who managed to come out of his premature phase relatively unscathed. Thank you very much for having me here. What an amazing and inspiring talk. Thank you so much. Um, any questions from the audience? Well, I, I have one. The manufacturers of the syringe, syringe pumps and all these devices, what do they have to say when you present this data to them? Because presumably they're selling these devices to you, and, and I'm, I'm looking at our sponsors in the background here, um, on, based on their precision. Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, I'm doing a workshop on Friday, actually, at um, Air Zermatt, where we'll talk about that a little bit more. But essentially, if you read the very small print in, in their in manuals, they say don't use 50 mil syringes when you're running at less than a mil an hour. Something a lot of people conveniently don't know. It's very interesting. I should start reading the things. Um, question at the back. Do we have a roving mic? Or should, uh, 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 oh, no, uh, sorry, could we just uh, ask you to ask it into the mic so for the people streaming at home? <laughs> Maybe not at home, maybe they're streaming at work, I don't know, or other places, but I don't want to know. The, turn your camera off at the other end. I was just wondering what you do for air protection, hearing protection. Oh. I'll see you Friday. Um, yes, hearing protection is very important. Um, we use, you can get these sort of called mini muffs, never Google that. Um, things. The uh, noise pressure by about seven decibels, which is just not good enough, really. So there's quite a lot now of hard ear defenders, which are aimed at the sensitive children to gigs. Um, and some of them are sort of baby sizes. I've got a set with me I'll be showing off on Friday. They reduce the noise pressure by about 30 decibels, which is a lot better. And I would advocate all road and air transport. Oh, go for it. I'm just abusing my position here at the speaker, but I want to go heli skiing, and I asked Patrick, and he said I had to find three friends. So come and chat to me later if you're interested. Well, I, I think uh, we can sort that out for you, can't we? I th I've done the heli skiing a few years ago. It is fantastic. I, I went up there with one of the other speakers who was a uh, ex Apache pilot, and it was um, I think the two pilots were trying to show off to each other. It was amongst the most terrifying, exhilarating moments in my life. Uh, we have one more question there. Hey, a fantastic talk, really raising some interesting questions. Um, and there's sort of a, a, an aversion to flying newborns, uh, probably driven by the movie industry, I suspect. Yeah. Um, have you dealt with any sort of resistance or otherwise uh, friction when considering flying newborns partly for this sort of IVH mitigation? Oh, yes, totally. Um, and this is a real area of interest of mine because, you know, I'm an educator and I'm trying to, you know, teach people to fly safely and to make good decisions. Every team, I think, who flies newborns asks this question. And so there's quite a lot of research out there. So air transport, whether it be fixed wing helicopter compared to road, has not been shown in any study to be an independent risk factor for IVH. Um, I worked in Australia. We did some great work in Sydney where we're doing ultrasound scans of babies before and after road and helicopter transfer and not seeing any development of pre-existing IVHs. Um, there's a lot written out there. Um, some of it's counterintuitive. You think, well, I'm shaking this baby. Surely something's going to happen. But the forces in road transport are also there as well. Um, I think we've just got to, whatever mode of transport we do, we've got to be better at it. And there's some great, clever innovations out there to reduce the vibration. Um, you know, in Switzerland and in Germany, you've got ambulances where the incubator is almost isolated from the table. Um, you know, more things like that, more ways just to keep these babies as still and to reduce these forces. Talk to me later. I could talk for hours about that. Thank you so much. I, I can't believe you're, you're bigging up the Germans. The whole point of this conference is to wind them up. Well, at least mine is anyway. <laughs> so...
<laughs> but the, uh, for our next speaker, we've got um, Suka Demitra uh, from Mannheim in Germany. I should probably should have thought of that before winding up the Germans. Um, he's a uh, he's a pediatric uh, neonatologist uh, and pediatric intensivist uh, and pulmonologist. He has over twenty five years experience, uh, and we're going to stay small for the for the next uh, talk. And uh, Mannheim, incidentally, was probably the first place ECMO was performed on a child in Germany in 1987, and it was in that unit. Um, I'm not sure if Suka was working there then. I'm assuming he's far too young and sprightly for that. Um, but what we're going to talk about is the differences between uh, ARDS in adults and in children. So, Suka, where are you? Yes, years. Thank you. So... I think this pedestal is made for pediatricians because we are thought to be very small and for me especially of course so I hope everybody can see me still because it should be even higher for me. Okay so I w I'm going to talk on uh, ventilation uh, points on, on pediatric ARDS and we'll do some comparisons to adult because we have to know that pediatric patients are much nearer to adults than to neonates for example so uh, neonates are completely different, but interestingly, guidelines now are more similar in neonates for, with the adults than pediatrics do. So we, we, can, we can go through that a, a little bit, and then uh, I will show some challenges also. So let's see whether this works. Yes. Ah, this works also. Okay, th so if we look at the guidelines, I mean, this part is known by, by adult medicine anyway, but we have the ch challenge or the difference in oxygenation uh, levels, let's say. An oxygenation index is used in pediatrics, which is integrating mean airway pressure to the usual PF ratio, which is, which is different in adults. So we use, we use these, oops, we use these numbers. And if, if, it's, if it's more than 16 in oxygenation index, this is a more severe level. And last year, the uh, guidelines changed. We changed the guidelines to have only two levels and no more three levels. So that's a difference which is resulting from uh, results of therapy. So we have to look at that and, and see what happens. So if we look at data from epidemiologic studies, and this is just a cohort out of this epidemiologic study, but showing more details. And there you can see if you are in the less severe areas, even this, this is the group where you have no ARDS already, mild and the moderate, and only the severe group is really changing in mortality, and all other mortalities are quite resembling each other. So the mortality is ranging there about 10%, so we may, reach, we, we have, we may have reached this uh, basic mortality, which may result from more from the underlying disease than from uh, from mechanical ventilation in ARDS or any other ARDS therapy itself. So that's a good point. So maybe in pediatrics we do something good. Although we, we, we will see that we don't adhere to many uh, guidelines. Okay, so the guidelines are made for now to, to just to implement lung protective ventilation. You all know that. And these parameters have, to, uh, have been uh, put in the, these uh, bundle, and I don't know why they missed the respiratory rate, but it could be some point to discuss uh, at the end, but they, they just focused on these values. So, and then the re recommendation is leaned on adult studies, on adult meta-analysis, without having pediatric data, but then you see it's, whoops, it's different. It's 28 for the standard pediatric patient, because the majority is less than five years old, and and uh, uh, and only if you have a reduced chest wall compliance, then you should go up. But it's still different from adults, and it's relying on adult data at the end. So why is why is this? I mean, if you look at the thorax of patients being less than five or six years old, you will have always a uh, a higher uh, chest wall compliance, which means that uh, the the, the chest wall is always softer in, in these children having an, a, a pediatric ARDS. And this is important uh, for considering pressures in, in uh, which we just put in the thorax at the end. So what happens is 
if you have this situation with a soft thorax, you will have much more influence or affection of the lung by the pressure given to the lung. And at the other side, if you have a stiff thorax and a soft lung, you will have much more pressure and power giving in to the thorax rather than to the lung. So you have to consider this. So maybe, and that's not uh, the standard uh, therapy, it is important to, to measure this difference and to go in with transpulmonary pressure measurement. So I will show you examples for that later on. And if we start with another pressure, we have the plateau pressure now defined as a 28 in standard and only in an exception of stiff thorax, like in neuropediatric patients, we would go up to 32 or even more if we know what the portion of this stiff thorax is. And if you go on with uh, other pressures which we have to set, like driving pressure and PEEP, we start with PEEP because then we can change the driving pressure accordingly. And there you can see uh, in this cohort, this is from Children's Hospital in uh, LA from Robbie Kemani School, and they just compared the standard setting PEEP by clinical judgment, which is the blue curve, <coughs> with a survival of a PEEP set by the ARDS network table, which is a much higher PEEP at the end. And there you can see that the survival of patients has been doubled with this. So this is why the pediatric uh, guideline can say concisely you should start with the, using the lower PEEP FiO2 table and then go on with titrating on oxygenation, on uh, compliance or hemodynamic par parameters. So PEEP is very clear for us now at the end in pediatrics. And if we look then for uh, driving pressure, with, this, with an optimized PEEP, we can distinguish uh, higher or lower than 15, even in children. And you know all the adult data on that, which is very impressive. And we even have it in this observational study, just using lower driving pressure, lower than 15, uh, uh, than higher than 15, we, you, you can see at least uh, changes in the small group in, in hospital stay, length, uh, length of ventilation parameters, of course not on mortality in this very small group. But the recommendation is clearly now to have a limit at 15 like in adults in this case. Now coming to the last point of the tidal volume, I always say in pediatrics we only need to focus on the pressures and not so much on the volume. So now, for the first time, uh, the volume has been added to guidelines. And it's getting quite uh, similar to the adult one. But if we look at the data on pediatrics, it's looking like this. And I just chose the, the most extreme values, comparing less than 7 with greater than 12. And you have no difference in children. And you can do this 8 versus 10 or 6 versus 10 or something like this. It's never changing. Every time it's the same. So what's the problem with the tidal volume? The tidal volume is a mix of all patients having a, an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, which does not have to be a, a completely clear ARDS in terms of lung mechanics. That's the big difference maybe in children also, because if you look at this x-ray, for example, people said, okay, this is an ARDS patient, we, we start ventilation, and then they called us to take over the patient because they said, oh, we are trying to increase the PEEP from six to eight and patient deteriorates. And it's very, uh, and has a very uh, bad oxygenation. So when patient arrived at us, at our hospital, we saw, okay, they have a quite high uh, respiratory rate for, for, young, uh, for, for a five uh, year old girl, but it's, it's in the range of, uh, of her age, but she has a PEEP of six. But if you see, if you look at airway mechanics, you see something different. If you look at the static compliance measured here, it's, it's more than 50% of uh, related to the, to, the, uh, to the weight, which is one per kilo is a good um, thump uh, rule where you can say, okay, that's the normal value. So for this child, 18, a compliance of 18 would be ideal. And if it's le not less than 50%, it's not a real ARDS. In a severe ARDS with this saturation, you would have around 25 to 30% of the normal value. So the compliance should be much lower. And at the other hand, you see this high resistance, which is comparable in this age uh, nearly as an adult. So it's, it's, 
it's clearly high, so there is an obstructive component in this disease. So therefore, the, the, the solution was just to reduce the rate and then just to wake the patient up and you could reduce the control pressure. And just a few hours later, it looked like this. It was on pressure support ventilation and you are ju just fine with, with reduced uh, situation. So you can just handle if you better and more specific and more individualized if you look at airway mechanics. That's the main point on this. And that's a, a big point in pediatrics because you, you will always have a mixed disease or a mixed a component which you have to look at even if, if per definition ARDS patient. Okay, and if you look at our uh, ECMO data from patients uh, taken to ECMO uh, in, in the pediatric age group, we see the diagnosis, the main diagnosis which we take on ECMO, they have a viral pneumonia. And the viral pneumonia patients are always associated with an obstructive disease, at least in a mixed way in, in when they develop an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. I don't say ARDS to them because it's, it, we have to distinguish them. And the real PRDS patients are much less in the percentage who go, to, uh, go on ECMO. And in adults, it's a little bit different, but there should be something in adults also. And if we look at then, uh, if we look at transform, if we look at airway mechanics, we should also look in certain uh, situations at transpulmonary pressure when we have to know whether our, our pressure settings are really fitting to be uh, lung protective enough in our ventilation boundaries. So what we, if we have values like this where we are too high, when we take over such a patient, we, we put the catheter in and we see the transpulmonary pressure curve, can do also some uh, uh, expiratory hole to see whether there is an intrinsic PEEP and here, here, here is one. So what we can do is react on this, reduce uh, saturation and then go up with the PEEP. We can put it on, on the uh, related to the uh, expiratory phase of the transpulmonary pressure curve and then it can succeed because we can reduce the driving pressure and that's all our goal to do and that's has been shown also like in adults and thereby reduce an oxygen. And our main goal here in ventilation is to have a very low driving pressure in the lung, so in the, uh, in the transpulmonary pressure curve measure. So, and if you look at, this is a survey which we did in the, uh, res with the respiratory section of the German Society of Neonatal and Pediatric Intensive Care, where we asked PQs in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland what they re usually do in, in pediatric ARDS patients. And one of the points is that this is what is recommended in the guideline, and it is <laughs> the, the, the lowest pro the procedures who are uh, used in the, yes, um, very less. And, uh, and they do much more, which is much more experimental, maybe. Uh, even the, the prone positioning is, is not really uh, evidence in, in pediatrics, uh, but, but it's, it's a good experience. So everybody is believing in it. And here the tidal volume is more re re relied on than the, the, the pressure settings. So there is something which has to be done with the adherence, obviously. And in this study, they did an international observation and looked what has been done in pediatric patients. And there's no correlation between chosen driving pressures with the tidal volume which resulted. So if you even go up with the pressures, you don't have any change in tidal volume or in CO2 and a significant change. So in this uh, observation, 70% of time, the ARDS net table was not used. You have a P, P plateau not measured in 79% of time and a median delta pressure, which because driving pressure was not a level, a median de uh, delta pressure was more than 18 or equal to 18 in all ARDS patients over the time. So that means there is a problem also with adherence. So it, it looks like that in the clinical setting, we cannot deal with all these parameters which we could measure and could think about and could think about airway mechanics. So maybe a solution is to automatize more. So there are modes available like the ASV mode who, where the ventilator just calculates um, respiratory rate and, and also pressures 
uh, to get the optimum uh, by just looking at uh, tight, um, time constants and also getting the optimum uh, driving pressure. So even with this, if you tell clinicians to give an uh, volume targeted ventilation mode with, a, with the lowest pressure you could achieve, in order to get less than 15, they, they succeed to, do, to go less than 15, but with an automatized uh, measurement of airway mechanics, you can even improve that. So there's a potential in this uh, way to go for maybe. And the next step of this automatization of just using pressures would be to, to add some decision support, which can be computerized also. And this is what the, uh, the group in, in children's in, in LA do to, to start with this first step. And this is the first feasibility study that which they did just giving recommendations and in the first phase, they just looked at how is the acceptance. And the red line is showing in different recommendation areas where the acceptance rate is. And it's, it's around 80% to 90% at, at most of all. And the, the red line shows this overall one and that's the patient per patient one, which is fluctuating, of course. So there's still some concerns, but it is possible to implement this, and also the next step would in this would be in future to automatize. So I, I would be happy to discuss these points because it's very difficult to accept from conditions to go for automatization in, in such an area which is quite complex. So in conclusion, I would say there are guidelines which are quite helpful, but you have to think over like the airway mechanics and look at the individual patient uh, but also you have to try to adhere uh, with this new knowledge to put that in the in the guidelines and additional awareness is of course necessary for especially for airway mechanics and transpulmonary pressures and i think automatization will have be helpful in in future so i'm happy to discuss this thank you Thank you. Very, very interesting uh, topic area there. I see any hands. So, with the um, with the automation of the ventilation, uh, this presumably is using an algorithm by that particular manufacturer for the ASV. Yes. Have there been any moves to try and get sort of bigger data sets, or maybe even use AI to try and modulate this? Because it seems like a very complicated area with lots of parameters feeding into each patient. I mean, the next step in the ASV is to just go for not only airway mechanics and to add the CO2 measurements like entitled CO2 and SpO2 measurements. That's already possible with the IntelliVent function, which you can add to the ASV. And after that, you still have to adapt to the children because it's coming from the adults uh, where you have to at least optimize the measurements, not the algorithm it itself because it's measuring quite well the, the time constant. And of course, now the next step would be to get the data, but in these times we have first have to uh, say, uh, build the ground for, for getting this data from the, from the regulatory side. And, but of course, this is the next step to, to go for in this automatic modes at least. And this is looking mainly at data from within intensive care units within the hospital. Yes. yes. But obviously, when your teams go out to retrieve patients mm -hmm. from smaller units uh, or pre-hospitally, obviously the, the, the stormy course of the child's ventilation and illness is probably far worse at that point. Have you looked at any of the sort of trying to get that precision and that kind of modulation into that part of the care when the child is unstable? Yes. Um, we are getting the patients always by, by ourselves because that influences the outcome clearly. That's the first point, especially more on neonates than in pediatrics, but it's, it's also true for, uh, for pediatrics. But at the other hand, we, we experience to not do too much at the site because at the end, you, the equipment is, uh, is uh, yes, uh, you cannot, with a transport ventilator, you would not be able to measure transpulmonary pressure, but you could use ASV. But then you have to rely on uh, all the parameters you just have at site. So it's, it's better for us to do it in, in, in our site, but the clinician does some adjustments. And usually he arrives, when he arrives two hours later, he arrives with a better state. So sometimes you cannot even <laughs> optimize it <laughs> when he is, he is in the hospital. You are right. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Any 
Any questions from the audience? Were you all keen to do ultrasound and get skiing? Thank you very, very much. So, uh, for those of you that want to go skiing, I believe that 12.30, the half-day passes active.